Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for coming to the uh, public informational meeting for the potential purchase for the Chapter 61 uh, land that's centered around 241 Boxborough Road. Uh, my name is Mike Kopchinski. I'm the chair of the Stowe Municipal Affordable Housing uh, Trust. And at the front table are the other, uh, some of the other members, Laura Spear, Cynthia Perkins, and Ingeborg um, Higgerman Clark, who's our uh, selectman's representatives. So um, the point of tonight is, is we've had the public, the public hearing, the official public hearing. So the point of tonight is just about information. So we're going to go through, and we're going to go through. We're going to talk a little bit about just affordable housing and so. We're going to talk about kind of the status, the demographics of the town, the Chapter 61, more detail than we gave at the at the last meeting. We're going to talk a little bit about 40B, and the point is to answer questions that are coming up from, from the town. So this is not a kind of presentation where we would expect that you would hold your questions. If something comes up on the screen and you have a question about it, that would be an excellent time to ask it while we have the information right up there. So that's, that's, the, that's the whole point of this. Is the, and we're, we don't necessarily have, we start at 6.30, we will go until, until, you know, you know <laughs> until there's no more questions, I guess. Until we've covered all the material and there's no more questions. So, um, and that, that's the point of what we're doing here. We are televised live tonight, and it's going to be taped and played on Stowe TV. On, on, I don't know what the schedule will be, but if there are folks who uh, you know who could not be here tonight, please let them know that that's, that this is recorded and we'll be have the opportunity to, 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 to watch it in whole or in part. So, um, so I thought we've we've well. So in, Laura and I will be kind of splitting up the presentation. Laura will be talking about the chapter stuff, and and we're all going to be answering questions as it comes into our, uh, as we cross different areas of expertise. But I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, for some of you folks, also you, many of you here come to other meetings, so some of this, is meant, much of it will be review, and, and this is probably stuff that you know already, but again, we're, we're keeping in mind that there may be people at home who have not followed these topics that frequently, so we wanted to lay it out a little bit more uh, uh, in depth. So the purpose that of wh why the why the trust was originally created was there was a, a statute um, that was passed and Stowe was one of the first I think one of the first ten or fifteen towns in the you know, out of the three hundred fifty one cities and towns that um, that adopted a trust and we accepted at the first one we accepted at at town meeting two five we just accepted the the state statute as it as it as it uh, as it came out originally uh, in the MGL. However, we, as as the group was formed and we got together, we realized that they gave really, really broad powers that we didn't, we weren't comfortable that that these powers were. We could borrow without asking the town. We could. There was a lot of things that that, that just didn't make sense. And we buy buy or buy or sell a, a property, and that's fine for bigger towns, like Cambridge and Brockton, and the, and and I think the statute was written for towns like that didn't make sense and stuff and we wanted to make sure that we had more checks and balances so we spent a, a little a while um, first we put some uh, procedures just, just took the the state of the arts some procedures and who who was going to be on the, the the trust and and made those all these definitions we accepted that in 2006 and then there's a couple of changes that we made in 2008 2011 to in 2008 to further restrict the powers because we we as we were starting out uh, I'm one of the original members I think I don't think anybody else was here originally but um, we've had people who've been very long standing we just you don't know who's going to be here in 20 years on the trust so we wanted to think about now well we trust everybody here but who's around the table but who's going to be on this table in 20 or 30 years and we wanted to make sure that we were thinking about checks and balances and trying to kind of circumscribe the the rights that were given to us by the statute so that it fit our town also wanted to make sure because it's a trust that the that we didn't have individual liability, and so as part of that, we traded that off to be able to be considered municipal employees of the town, so we'd be covered under the town liability if anything were to happen. 
and it just seemed like a good idea. This, just all the individual. Why would you want to be a trustee of a, of this if 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 something happened and you had liability? That would not you know that we would would not encourage people to, to join. So we thought that was a good trade off. And in 2011, we asked the town. We realized that we could give money away, but we couldn't loan it. It didn't seem to make a lot of sense. We could give people. I could give you a hundred hundred thousand dollars, but I couldn't loan you hundred thousand dollars with the expectation to get it back. It wasn't in the original statute, uh, or at least in our bylaws, so we, we uh, amended that so that we could. And we actually used that, and for the Pilot Grove, we actually loaned money, and it's been paid back. And it's one of the few, we're one of the few trusts who've actually made a loan and been paid back on it. So that's, you know, that's something. Anyway. So what we do is we advocate for housing issues and coordinate with the other towns and departments and committees about housing issues. So whether it's CPC or the Planning Board, uh, we work with, for instance, the master plan five years ago when the master plan was being done. We worked to coordinate, make sure our survey dovetailed so that a lot of the information that um, came up for the master plan was was usable for the for the housing production plan and the housing portion of the of the master plan and those types of things. So we try to coordinate uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and the housing production plan is a five year plan that's made. It's part of one of the things that is important to do in terms of being able to have. Um, relief from the 40B strictures, you need to have three things. You need to show that you have a housing production plan that's been accepted by the state. You need to have uh, make progress toward that and the also to uh, create a certain number of units. And in our case, that's that's 13 units a year or to get to 10% of the total housing. We'll get to that a little bit more. Um, we also are responsible for coordinating the monitoring of the housing Im housing inventory we currently have, which was the preservation, making sure that we don't lose any units that we have. We've uh, just at the last uh, a recent town meeting we created with the help of uh, CP the Community Preservation uh, Committee, an affordabil affordability safeguard program for units that are currently in the, in the inventory but are at risk due to foreclosure or other reasons so that we can maintain those, so that the town has an option on those and we needed a certain pool of money so that if, if one of those one of those homes became uh, foreclosed, that we could buy it and then find another seller because the bank is not very does not have a lot of incentive to find a, a, an affordable uh, eligible buyer. We have a grant program and a pre-development loan program. Again, that's what I, we discussed earlier about the about the loan. And uh, the last thing we've been charged to do, and we've been kind of getting our a lot of this has been prefatory to being able to, at some point, be able to develop town-owned property. And we've had a couple of, we have a couple, and I think, Laura, you'll maybe talk about this, about the, the properties that we have. There's a couple of properties um, that we've looked at, and we've looked at all the town-owned properties that are not that are not developed, and winnowed that down to just two that, that have the potential for development, and we're moving forward on, on those things. So a, a, sna a snapshot of the affordable Oh yes, hi, sir. So you, you mentioned the housing production plan. Yes, I, I understand that you're actually working on the, a new version. Correct. Is is there a draft that's available that, or is that ready for? Um, for we're very close. We were supposed to have received a, a newer draft last week, and we haven't gotten it yet. So we're oh. still waiting for that. But we have had preliminary drafts that we've shared with the planning board. Uh, we've looked at it as as part of SMOT. Uh, it incorporates what the state expects us to provide in a housing production plan. We just can't make it up. We have to follow their guidelines, unfortunately, uh, and uh, trying to make sure that it fits what Stowe needs. So we will have that available very shortly, and we have to have it approved by both the planning board and the board of selectmen before we can actually send it to the state for certification. Yeah, the, s the, the selectmen actually send it. They're the, the, the they're the body that actually send it to, to the uh, Department for Housing and Community Development, and we we usually though what we've learned is that if we send it to DHCD ahead of time, we can sh they they can flag any problems before it's official. So we're we're going to be probably getting close enough to do that. Question? Nope. No. Um, Follow up question to that. Sure. So in the housing production plan, if you can share that with us exactly what the draft is. Is uh, the property at 241 bucks per road a portion of that plan for the next five years? Uh, I don't way? think when we were writing that we... <coughs> we... We are not able to identify specific properties that are in Chapter 61 programs. However, mm -hmm. we do have the fact that Chapter 61 program opportunities is one of our strategies. Mm 
you mentioned the uh, Boxborough property as a portion of that plan. As I say, we're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. We cannot pinpoint specific Chapter 61 lands in town and say we want this parcel versus this parcel. Uh, you can do that for open space and conservation purposes. In fact, we encourage our com committees to do that because it's already in that use. And so town council advised us not to go after very specific chapter 61 properties as part of our housing production plan. So there's 241 isn't mentioned, nor any other chapter 61. Um, so just take a kind of a go out to, at, the, at the macro level from the Commonwealth perspective. The point of, of affordable housing, there is a there's a goal through the Mass General Laws Chapter 40B to have 10% or more of the total living units in each town be affordable, with the idea that, that statewide that there's a shortage for for housing for folks that are have less than the median income. Um, it affects every one of I think you've heard me say this before. If you haven't, I say, it, I say it every day pretty much, but we don't have a housing policy in the Commonwealth. We have 351 housing policies. Each town interprets this uh, 40B as um, addresses their own needs, which means that it's a hodgepodge. There's very little regional planning. There's some regional coordination, but every town, since every town's responsible for that 10% in their town, they have, they, these towns are very unwilling to cede control or, or authority of, of, the, of the housing policies in their town for that reason. And so it's, it's, a, it's very much a patchwork. All right. Yes. <coughs> the 2,500 is based on, is that the 2010 census? Right. So we, we continue to operate on that number 25 is the basis until 2020? Correct. Correct. Although, Even um, though more housing units have been although created. although there is there is now as as time has gone on now there's a little bit there's more granularity so the uh, we had at this point we, I think we had to have eleven or twelve units and now that's gone up to thirteen I believe because of the added <coughs> units that have gone up and now now there's a little bit more in terms of what our annual okay. but our ten percent number is still set in, two, in twenty ten until we hit twenty twenty. But the numbers that we had to add for uh, each year, you know, so it's a half percent a year to get safe harbor, that goes up with what your current, with not by these numbers, but by your current. Okay, thank you. Sure. Question. It's kind of, yes? Um, first line states it as a goal. It's, it's a goal as opposed to a requirement? Um, well, if it was a requirement, there would be very few towns that would, you know, that would be in, 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 in compliance. Okay. Meaning that uh, my next question, I don't know if you're going to cover sure. this later. What are the consequences to mm. the town ah. of not meeting? The we, we will. Yeah, we will be covering that shortly. So that'll be good. Thank you. Thanks. A good question. <laughs> um, so we're currently 179 units, 71 units needed to get that. It puts it at 7.16%. Seven, uh, seven, uh, That's a higher level of precision than we need, but there you go. <laughs> um, 29. Um, we the projection is in 2020 that there'll be 20 2950 units and that would put a if we stay at 179 until then we would have 116 additional affordable units to reach 10 percent but we can by having a housing production plan that's accepted by the state and by working toward our housing production plan the things that we say we're going to do in housing production plan and by building 13 units a year we can uh we can get 12 months of safe harbor from the bad things that happen if you don't not at 10%, which we'll discuss shortly. Yes. Do those 13 units need to be new construction or can they be deep conversions, like you were saying before, buying foreclosures? It would be, it would be, um, they don't have to be, but practically they almost always are. Uh, it's very difficult to get DHCD to sanctioned programs that aren't new construction because of their the housing and community development. There's an economic development aspect to what they're doing. So yes, they want to do housing, but they also want to stimulate the economy at the same time. So it's, it's a fine balancing act, but in general, you know, in theory, yes. In practice, they're almost always new construction. Is, is that fair? Is that Very fair. Okay. <laughs> Trying to be politic and, and fair <laughs> at the same time. Um, so, Stowe is considered as part from an economic perspective. We're considered of the, the Boston uh, housing and urban development area, the median 
household income for Boston is $98,100 for a household of four. The moderate household limit, which is 80% of that median household income is $73,050. So if you look at current Stowe households, 670 of the total house households are at moderate income or below. And there's in the, in the, in the range from 50 to 80, which is 9.4%, which is in general, because of, the, because of the, the location of Stowe and such, we tend to aim for that 50 to 80 because it need for home ownership, um, because of the distance, there's no, there's no transportation and such. We tend to have, there's not, there's like, you know, you can't take a train or you can't take a bus to work. We tend to have, need people who have a car or maybe even two cars, so the, the income rate. So we, it really, we skew toward the higher end of that scale. It's very difficult for somebody at the 25% of median income to survive in Stowe. Just there's not jobs to walk to and there's a lot of, a lot of the services that you would need at low income are just not available there. So. So I just I want to interject. Please, please. When we talk about affordable housing, we're talking about a family of four making seventy thousand dollars. We're not talking about people who are destitute and on the streets. Right. You can see. You <laughs> okay. see. Just want to make sure people here, understand so the right context. These here. are tiny little numbers, and I don't expect you to read them. We just wanted to show with, that there's a range here. But we have limits of thirty percent, sixty percent of the median income, and what the what for a for, uh, for um, Essentially, the lowest level is twenty nine thousand four hundred fifty dollars. Goes to forty nine, fifty eight, seventy three, depending on those levels. And that's and in affordable housing, you're considered not cost burden if you're spending less than thirty percent of your income on housing. Now, of course, there's a lot of people in Stowe who choose to spend more than thirty percent of their disposable income of their income. But in many cases, that's not people who are in you know, are in subsistence, just barely getting by. They, they choose to do that because that's part of their discretionary income that they spend and they want to stay in a nicer house and they do that. Um, so there's a lot of folks who do that, but we're, we're talking with folks at, at the median income or below. So. Right. Just yes. so something I came across recently, uh, it's from a state number and I can't quite s cite you chapter and verse, but it's comparing uh, in the region uh, median incomes uh, up to date numbers. Right. I've seen two different numbers, uh, and so it, uh, pick somewhere in the middle. Okay. But the, what I, the numbers I saw was somewhere between 130 and $151,000 is the median family income in Stowe. Well, uh, that's a split. I think that's flip. our next, next slide. Here's our next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. There you go. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I, I've seen a number higher than that. Is my right. Point. So, um, so this is this this data this data comes from um, from the federal government, and so there are depending on the way that you calculate things and what income is included, that number can vary. But the I, this number is generated the same way the numbers are generated for the affordable housing eligibility, so it's on the same scale. Okay. If you took a larger number, that might be true, but then those other numbers may move a little bit too. So, so but my, my so point is more of a not a, a technical one, sure. but realizing, looking at this myself, right? Almost everybody in Stowe, when you look around, every other person would be hypothetically, statistically, right? Me Below median income for moderate. Below median income, right? Exactly. That's right. Median is. To remind everybody is the if you line everybody up, everybody's salary up, and you pick the one that's in the middle, half the people are above the median, half the people are below the median. It's not an average, it's it's just everybody's lined up in a line. So yes. I assume that's your adjusted as well, something like that. I don't no, I don't think it's I don't think no, this is this is total income. This is not this is not take home. I believe, right? Right. When you when one applies for low-income housing. Right. Is there any discussion of assets as opposed to income? Yes, and that's, so this comes up particularly with, with elders or people who are on fixed income often. So um, the folks will often have a very low income but have some assets, either saved up assets or, or real property. In general, I think that the, the, the formula that's used, Laura, this is, this is where I may have to go to Laura, but I think, it, I believe they take 10% of any real assets you have or any 
financial, you know, if you have money saved, and then 10% is, and 10% of that is considered to be income. So the add 10% of that added to what other, what other income you may have, let's say you're on a fixed income, social security or whatever, pension, you take that plus 10% of whatever else your assets are, and if then, then that's the number that is used for your, um, for that, for that income number for in terms of eligibility, I believe. I think it's 10%. But uh, again, that changes a little bit. And that's why we have a housing consultant specialist. Uh, we pay Leonardi to, to do these things because none of us have time to, to, to follow all this. But changes from year to year. A um, couple interesting things is that the, in the, that the number has gone down by 5% from 2010 to now. Um, it's gone down 5% in terms of the households with 18 or younger. And the households with members over 65 have gone up 8% in that time period. 90% uh, of the housing is single family homes, so as opposed to apartments or uh, common wall type things. And at the time of, at the time of the SOF survey, uh, the 25% of the people who responded to our survey said that they are they pay more than 30% of their an, an, annual income for housing. So again, that doesn't mean necessarily that they're, uh, that could be that they make a lot of money and they spend, they have a very expensive house, that could be the case. but. Um, by you know, technically, if you spend more than thirty percent, you're cost burdened, even if you're above the median income. Yeah. What's the um, actual percentage of households with eighteen or younger and on the other side? That's that's in the housing production plan. I don't. Um, I can. We can. We can get that to you. Maybe Laura can look it up while we're while we're doing here. But it is in the housing production plan as part. The most of the demographic data is shared. Uh, there's a. Um, group called MEPC that some of you may know, and, and they actually, it used to be that every town would have to go out and do all this demographic work themselves, and this, this state, or it's, it's a public, pri is it a public-private partnership, MEPC, or is it actually a? No, that's public. It's, it's public. Mm -hmm. um, so they essentially, they share the, demo they, they, they generate that generate that uh, demographic data, and everybody can share off of that, and you can find stuff specifically for each town, but it makes, makes the housing production plan a lot easier, because uh, in the past, you had to go and dig all that information out yourself, and now it's, it's shared. All right, so the question was, uh, what percentage of the population is 18 and under? And so we only have the 2000 and 2010 data. And so in Stowe, in 2000, it was 28.2%. In 2010, it dropped to 26.6%. And I think that uh, if you put it in a broader spectrum, we saw that the population in Stowe is getting older in general, and so we have people who are more senior citizens, smaller households, and then the family with younger people is getting smaller as a percentage okay. of the total households. So, and, and on the other end, the 65 and older? And the uh, yes, I can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2000, it was 8.2%, and in 2010, it was 12.7%, mm -hmm. and this is according to the decennial census data. So there is there is more um, some of the data that we have. That's the official data. There's some data that's that's, that's extracted from uh, not census, but from voting registration and from other stuff. And looking at those trends as well. I mean, Mark, you've been doing a lot of this, right? I mean, look at it. Um, but but we see that it's, it's it's continuing to grow in that in that direction. It's getting this is getting smaller and this is getting larger. So well, since 2000. Um, so, again, Laura mentioned about affordable housing in terms of what, and, and, and again, um, this is not a, uh, there, are different, there are different layers and different kind of strata of affordable housing. And again, what is practical in Stowe is kind of the highest level just because of the other, the other um, expenses that it costs to live uh, where we do. You have to, you know, you're, you have your own water, you have your own, you have to pay for, for garbage collection, you have to pay for, you know, um, maintaining your sewers. There's a lot of other ex expenses that are involved with living in a, in a less dense environment. Um, so what we like to focus on, in both from our surveys and from the, the work that we do, is that the, the, there is a, a, a large group of people who grew up in town and cannot afford to stay here. They have moved away to college, they moved away to you know, lived in Cambridge for a while, they moved to other parts of the country, and they can't afford to move back in an ownership capacity. And there's very little rental, so they essentially can't afford to move back to Stowe. 
Most town employees, there are some town employees obviously who live here, but many town employees could not afford to live here on, based on their salaries. There's, I think, only four, uh, if, if the, I think there's only four employees that if they, it was the only source of income in, in, their, in their household, that they would be able to afford the median home. So that's, that's kind of where just where most so many of the folks either are in, you know, have multiple incomes in the home or live in surrounding towns. People come from, from you know, far west, have a long drive. Um, there's many, and we also mentioned that fixed income residents and elders who wish to downsize, these are, there's fixed income residents, certainly plantation apartments is, that is mostly, I think almost everybody is in a fixed, is on a fixed income situation there. And one of the things we're trying to do is expand that number of the, the, the opportunities there. Also, elders who wish to downsize, folks who have own, you know, we mentioned earlier about, about assets that they, they want to downsize their home. There's very little opportunity for affordable if you don't have a lot of money. You're hoping to, you know, use the, the money that you, the equity that you've built. But again, there are folks, and we've 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 seen this that there are folks who have not, they have not been able to afford their home for a while, and they let it um, kind of fall into disrepair. And it's very difficult for them now even to recover the equity they have because it's not a very desirable home. So, where, where does uh, meeting house fall into the spectrum of? Is that that's not. It's mark. That's it's mostly market rate. I believe. Yeah, rate. it's not. There's there's really no affordable, affordable development. No. There's no affordable there. I mean, at the um, at the Arbor Glen, there's a, a certain there's a small number of units um, that are affordable. Um, as we know, we've seen at that location, uh, the I think there's four units, and I think two of them have been chronically. There's been like. At least one has been empty for a, a big chunk of the time. Not the same one, but I mean, there's the average is about one because it's hard to find people who qualify, who 55 and over, can uh, don't have enough money to uh, be eligible for affordable housing and don't have so much assets that they that they don't qualify. So. And the, uh, what's it called? Green Stone. Yes. How many will it's time for there? At least four. Plus we have ten percent. They could have up as they're required to provide seven. Can you repeat the question? But they don't have, to have them all on site. That's so good. They have to have four on site, and then they pay uh, money to. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question for the for the folks at home. Just the for the uh, proposed adult active neighborhood on Boxborough Road, across the street from from this, or roughly across the street from. From the property we're discussing here, um, that is 66 six units, and for that there would need to be seven units built. But there's a sliding scale; not all of those units have to be built on site. Uh, it could be some of those units can be built on site, and some could be um, there a fee could be paid to the town in lieu of building that would go to um, to building. It goes to smart. It goes to, to smart. But, but so that would be one one possibility, one future possibility of funding for. But there are other options, and, and this is all fairly negotiable. So. so in the current year, when we're striving to get 13, do those apply this year, or does that come when they come online? It, when the building permit is uh, issued, is when they come online. So, like for instance, when we when when for Pilot Grove, when we got our two years, when those 30 bus uh, building permits were issued. Our two-year safe harbor started the day the next day. So these six that you're talking about, in some combination, if as soon as that building's done, um, even though whatever, they're right, any any play, any any whatever units are, are okay. we're talking about would be essentially they don't count until the building permits are are issued. Do you okay. have the power to enforce to enforce at that site the seven units? State law doesn't permit us. And just the four that we have in the bylaw. So basically, what that means is that someone can essentially buy their way out of that requirement. That, that's, that's true. For inclusionary and zoning, we have inclusionary zoning for other subdivisions. And, and put the pressure on someone else. Yeah. Puts pressure on SMOT. On SMOT. Right. <laughs> because well, money comes well, to us no, to produce. No, but it, but it, it has. It does. It, it, you're, you're exactly right. No, 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 nobody get any ideas on foot television. <laughs> Close <laughs> like, Nobody get any ideas. Uh, <laughs> trying to build them, not do the affordable units. It's important. It, it's it, it's you know it's it, we just don't have we don't have any sort of enforcement. I suppose if somebody came the next time, 
they wanted to build something, we would they would be they, they would have very difficult kind of getting a permit. But if they're only going to build one thing in town, that would be. But you according to our zoning bylaw, inclusion of affordable housing, we had to offer the options. Yeah. Town right. Council, when we originated this back, <coughs> I believe in 2003, said that we could not restrict it to only being on site. We had to provide the alternatives, and we had to give a number where they could opt out. So our trigger is at six units or more. And so again, we, we can't force that to happen. It's illegal to do that. We can with special permits. We can't with just normal by right development. Here, and state so law is there's proposals to change that so we can require it, but that hasn't passed the legislature. So following along with that, if they do four and the other three, they give you the money, but you have no place to spend the money, then what happens? Then, then we wait for an opportunity to spend. Don't lose the opportunity. How the money came, to, the money that that Smod already has came from Arbor Glen, yeah. only building portion of that. So that's how. It is. Karen, you had something. I just wanted to clarify the affordable Please. units do count as soon as a building permit's issued. Right. But if an occupancy permit is not issued within a year, oh, right. we lose that. Unit. Good point. Right. Right. So, if there's a delay, a construction delay, or something Correct. else happens, Correct. there's a problem. Right. Good point. Um, so we just want to, this slide is really just, just we, what, if we have an opportunity to discuss this, we want to make sure that everybody understands when we're talking about affordable housing, their folks already live in town, and 25% of the people who are living in town already are in this situation. These are, um, these are careers that are in that sort of range of terms of salary, and people you know, probably people who may live next door to already. But this is the, these are the types of, uh, so, of so occupations. <coughs> Sir? Like as you, you know, highlighting the people that uh, work in Kenoman and would need this type of housing. So you have a clear process where these people actually would be the ones that have the first right to the units that come online. So There's a police officer installed that wants to get into this. He would be first in line to actually get in one of those affordable units. There's a, I, I, mean, I may defer, I'm going to answer and then defer to Laura for the specifics, but there's a lottery system, and so folks in that situation that you just described would have preference, but it wouldn't, it doesn't line up like, okay, everybody in town, we're going to take everybody in town, then somebody outside of town. There's a lottery system, so they get, they get a, it's kind of like when the Celtics are looking for their draft picks, they get more balls in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the lottery when they, to, to, when they, the worse they do, but, um, State law allows a community to set, it used to be 70%, I think it's now down to 60% for local preference. So that you can actually have the lottery, but 60% of those folks would come from s either in Stowe, they already live here, they work in Stowe, or they have family, family in Stowe. So that's how you would do local preference. I mean, we have to follow the, the law. Right. And, and all this is important because if we don't follow the law, then that unit, even though we spent money and all that stuff, it would not be included in the housing inventory, which is the point of the exercise. So unless we follow all those rules and DHCD checks off that, we, yes, you did this, you did this, 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 it wouldn't, those units wouldn't count. So it's important for us to follow all those. It, and it's very complicated. And we thank, you know, Jesse and, and Karen in the past, and the planning board and ZBA. And it's, it's a group effort when these things happen. There's a lot of expertise that's required in different different uh, in different areas. Briefly, uh, I corrected some of the, the the information that was on this because I had made a mistake on my on my spreadsheet earlier. But um, the affordable prices, I had a little higher affordable prices, and our consultant said, "I don't know where you got those prices, Mike." So these are the right prices. So these are just examples for a one bedroom with two people. Affordable home price maximum is $155,000 for a two-bedroom unit with three people. 176 with two people, it's lower than that. Um, it's about the same. It's like one, maybe 160. And three bedrooms, four people, it's 199. That's the most that can be charged. That's how much. That's how much the most they can pay. Um, current, the the the, la this, the land value for for undeveloped land has been pretty stable, I mean, just going back and looking at it, for many years, it's been stable. It's been about $200,000 an acre, maybe from like 185 to, it's gone up to 220, but it's been pretty pretty stable for a buildable lot. And but the and the current in price has 
house, house values have doubled since the 1970s. Mike, what's the acreage for that number? Is that per one acre? Uh, that's a buildable lot, so it's one and a half. Okay. Um, I think that's yeah. Oh, and again, I just always want to point out that just because something's cheap doesn't mean it's 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 it, it counts to SHI. There could be a house that's in poor repair, very small house that's poor repair gets sold for two twenty. People say, how come that wasn't affordable? It's not a, not affordable because when they re if somebody fixes it up and resells it, they can sell it for market rate. It's right. only units that are restricted. Go ahead, please. So going to interject, SHI please? is a, a new term for probably some of you. It means the subsidized housing inventory, and that is the official list that the Department of Community and, and Economic Development in Massachusetts actually maintains to track whether we are at 10% or how close we are to 10%. So it has to be on that list, the SHI. So if someone says, oh, I have an affordable house, if it's not on the list, it doesn't count. Everybody clear on that? Image. Okay. So we wanted to have a, just an example, of just a quick overview of the whole town. And the, the blue circles are places where there's existable, existing affordable housing. The uh, green areas, which are these two, I just believe, right, um, are where there's permitted uh, affordable housing that's already been permitted. And the orange um, are areas where the planning board has been approached for development, but and potentially those developments would include some affordable housing. See, it's, there's a distribution around. It makes sense that, I mean, usually affordable housing makes sense to have density around the center of a town, close to, um, you know, for transportation services, close to the library, schools, and all those kinds of things. So it makes a certain amount of sense that there's there's a concentration there. But this is, you know, this is Pilot Grove, this is Plantation. Villages and that's, at Stowe. And that's Villages at Stowe. So those are the three big ones. Um, Let's see, and obviously 241 is right there. So in terms of there's going to be, you know, that's that's been uh, permitted. And again, it's four, you know, it's supposed to be seven units, but up to four. So now I'm going to. You guys OK if I just talk from here? OK, great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Chapter 61. I am not a lawyer. My career is in high tech, <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, a lot of what I've learned, I've just kind of learned from being on the front line trying to do affordable housing for the town of Stowe. Uh, every month I meet with other housing people. Uh, some of them are professionals, some are volunteers. We represent communities all across the entire Commonwealth, and so we share knowledge, and this is where I kind of absorb a lot of it. So if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, we also have some really great resources, too. So first of all, what is Chapter 61? Well, this was a program that originated back in the time of World War II, and it really was a temporary land protection measure to protect forest land and farmland. And basically, if you look at the value of your land today, if it's in a residential zone, you could say, oh, well, the market value of that would be what we just saw on the previous slide. So it's probably $200,000. But if you're not going to be building on it, why should I have to pay that market value? So in order to get a tax relief, having it assessed at a lower value, then you would enroll it in the, this program called Chapter 61. And so it really is designed to reduce the tax burden for the landowner. It is a temporary measure. OK, let's keep that in mind. It's for short term. It's not forever. All right. So what happens is the landowner will pay a lien. They pay the registry recording fees. And then ultimately, they would pay for the release of the lien fees when it's no longer in Chapter 61. In exchange for the lower tax rate, the, the landowner accepts the fact that the municipality has the right of first refusal should that land be converted into another use. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Great. And when I say about converted to another use, it could be the landowner saying, I want to take my forestry land and I'm going to put a house on it. So it doesn't even have to be sold. It just could be the landowner changing the use, or it could be sold for a use that's either residential, commercial, or industrial. And I saw your hand, just one yeah. second. And so the town has, as part of its right of first refusal under this law, 
120 days to decide whether to exercise that right of first refusal. The town basically has the ability to step in. Now, if it's being sold, the town steps in under the exact same conditions as the buyer. We can't negotiate, we can't change, we have to pay whatever the buyer would pay. Question. Isn't there a minimum for how long the land can be? In we'll go through that, absolutely. Okay. Because you're, you're stressing temporary, and I, it is I understand temporary. why yeah. you're doing that, but yeah. there is a minimum. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. I'm gonna go into the differences among the Chapter 61 programs. Okay. Yes. I have a question, which is, at the onset, when the state decided to create this program, it would seem to me that if, if the state, that the, the desire to preserve land and forestry of culture would be a desire that the state would want to maintain in fact forever. I mean, the state didn't say, presumably, uh, we'll do it for 10 years, but afterwards we don't but care. But the owner may not want that. The owner may want to reserve the right to do something with that land, whether it's five years, 10 years, or 20 years in the future. So they don't want to be locked into having a permanent restriction. And there are permanent restriction offerings. Okay, it's, it's temporary from the owner's viewpoint, but it seemed to me that the desire of the state would be a little, the motivation would be more permanent. It, the state gives the landowner the right to decide. Okay? And we'll go into that in a little bit. Yes. It, goes, it addresses what Sean thought is, is speaking of because in the first, in the prior uh, slide, you want to go back the to the intent. Slide? You that? Let's go back to the intent. Because mm -hmm. what I'm hearing, Laura, from you um, is that it was created to give us a tax break. Mm -hmm. I never actually interpreted the law in that fashion. Yes, it gives us a tax break, but didn't the government put it there basically to protect? on a temporary level, on a temporary basis, agriculture, forest, recreation. Absolutely. That Absolutely. was the original intent. But it is temporary. Yes, and so temporary. the And we'll, get, we'll but talk about... Is it really say temporary? Let's say it's, it's, yeah. it's, of, a, it's of a fixed... It's a short term. The law is not term. temporary, yeah. but the restriction for is time. depending on what the owner right. does right. with it. Right. I just wanted to be certain that we understood the intent of the law. The intent was so that you wouldn't have a whole lot of developers messing up all the land at the same time. Exactly. And so it also benefits the landowner from not exactly. having to pay full market value. It's good for pro. Yeah. Is yeah. anybody yeah. here at 41? Yeah. I better remember a good here. <laughs> 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 no, yeah. I was. <laughs> so, and then you, so you might know. <laughs> and I will say they did expand from just forestry with 61 back in the 70s. So that's why you'll hear chapter programs. There's chapter 61, there's chapter 61A, and then chapter 61B. And we're going to walk through each of those in a couple slides. Question. Yes. Uh, roughly how much is the percentage of the tax break? It, it depends on what the state forester assesses of that, and we'll get there. Okay? All right, so if you look at what we have in Stowe, we actually have a third of our land is developed, about a third, and it's rough, a third of it is permanently protected, and about a third of it is undeveloped. And of the undeveloped land, half of that is in a Chapter 61 program. So. We're really not having much opportunity to build a lot of affordable <coughs> land. When you're only dealing with a third of the town land that's available. And if half of that is already under Chapter 61, we don't have the ability to go to those properties to try to buy it, or if there's a house, we don't have the ability to go and try to change it. So it, this is something that, keep in mind the context, okay? We do have, as I said, about a third of the land is protected permanently. And you'll see that there are about 1,000 acres under a conservation restriction. We also have <coughs> the U.S. government and the Commonwealth owning a substantial amount of property. So Delaney is the Commonwealth. You got the Wildlife Refuge, that's the, the federal government. And I think actually, we actually have the best of all worlds. The fact that we have local land protection from our own town as well as the, the state and the federal government. I think it's great. Yeah, the, the TAN code stuff that's hard to kind of pick out on this, uh, and these slides will be available 
on the website so you can look at them. But the the, the, the beige tan colored uh, stuff is, is stuff that's permanently protected. Um, and the purple is stuff in 61B. B. Yellow is 61A. And this color green is um, 61. And CRAPR is the crosshatch, which I think is at this range. I'm not certain. Anyway, but that's the. Okay, don't expect to read it. <laughs> so, starting with Chapter 61, I'm not going to go into all the detail here. Again, the slides are going to be available. But it was originally known as the Forest Land Act. You have to have at least 10 acres of contiguous forest land, and it has to have been in a management plan for 10 years certified by the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And they assign someone from DCR, who is the state forester, to oversee that plan and certify it. Now, in terms of how the property is taxed and assessed, that is determined by something famously called the FVAC the Farmland Valuation Advisory Commission. So they are a state commission that will go in and actually look at the property and assess what the value would be. The classification for Chapter 61 does run for 10 years. The owner can then recertify it or withdraw from the program. So if you withdraw it, You'll pay your penalty. If you withdraw before the 10 years, you have to pay the conveyance tax. If you wait for the 10 years, you have to pay the rollback tax. And then a 5% interest was added across for all chapter lands for withdrawal, okay? However, you don't pay any penalty if the land gets renewed, if it gets put under another Chapter 61 program, or if it gets sold to someone who keeps it in a Chapter 61 program. Mm -hmm. No penalties. Doesn't change. Or if you build with for a family member. No. No, that's not. No. Nice. No. We're good. Okay. Sorry. And <laughs> sorry. And the last Earth. point. The last the point is, <laughs> I, and this was one I need a clarification on. If it just kind of slips away, it doesn't get renewed. Nothing really happens. The town has up to a year from when that ten-year period ends to actually act on a right of first refusal should the use change. Okay? Yes? Should the buyer of the land, of land wish to keep it in chapter, does the town still have their first right of refusal? If the buyer makes the commitment, signs the paper, does the certification to keep it in chapter 61, no, the town does not have right of first refusal. Okay. So it, the, the right, the, the town gets first refusal by notification from the landowner that they intend to withdraw from the program and that's what that's what triggers the right if there's any if they don't withdraw if they, they can convey the land or they can sell the land whatever and, and, and change uses within the program but they have to it, the notification the re refusal starts when the when the landowner says we're withdrawing from the program okay so that's I see lots of hands. <laughs> Before I get to sure. 61A, I will answer these questions. Yes. Well, just Courtney. a comment on the last question. Mm -hmm. If that land stays in chapter, there's still a right of first refusal if for the next time that it's Exactly. Mm -hmm. when exactly. It, when, it, when, it, when it's withdrawn right. from the program. Right. right. Exactly. Right. Question. So if the, if the town exercises the right of first refusal, does the owner still need to pay the back taxes? Yes. If the town exercises it? No. No. Okay. So uh, Chapter 61A, one of those programs that popped up in the early mm -hmm. 70s, was the Farmland Assessment Act. So they said, oh, it's not just forestry. Mm -hmm. What about farmland? You can see there are little crops in the background, you know, around the edge there. <laughs> Look hard. <laughs> and so this is really for agricultural or horticultural purposes. So raising animals or growing fruits and vegetables, maybe even shrubs, Christmas tree farms, that kind of thing. And so you need at least five acres in this area in order to qualify. And it has to be used for at least two years for that purpose. Again, it can include some of the productive forest land that was talked about in Chapter 61. Mm -hmm. uh, however, not a large percentage of it. I think it, it, you're capped to how much of it could be forest land. And you have to actually show that you're making money on this. 
So it has to be at least $500 on the first five acres each year, and then $5 per acre thereafter, except forest and wetland has to do 50 cents an acre. <laughs> Don't <laughs> ask me how they came up with these numbers. And my understanding is that this is uh, not enforced aggressively around the state. I, I can't comment. I have no personal knowledge. <laughs> but again, that famous FVAC commission actually does the assessment, and they have a whole schedule. They look at it, they see what is actually being used. So if it's Christmas trees, you might have one schedule. If it is farmland, it may be another. If it's shrub, it may be another. So they actually maintain that themselves, and they are the ones who actually decide what the assessment should be. Is there a skill schedule for medicinal marijuana? I, who knows? <laughs> it could be Maybe. added. Someday who in the future. Knows? Someday in the future. <laughs> exactly. So if you go back real quickly. Sorry, which one? Um, it's different. Instead of 10 years, this runs for one year, and the uh, landowner has to re-enroll by October for the following year, fiscal year. So they really have to decide in advance that they're going to keep this. Mm -hmm. All right, makes sense? Okay. Um, then later on in the 70s, became Recreational Land Act. I don't know if you can see the background. Golf courses. <laughs> what do we have in Stowe? Golf courses. We have apple orchards, 61A. Mm -hmm. And we have golf courses, 61B. Mm -hmm. And so this is really for open space and recreational land. Again, it has to be five plus acres. Uh, it could be natural, it could be wild, it could be open, it could be pastured, or it could be used in a landscape condition like golf courses. So again, this one runs for one year. It's assessed at a recreational use value, but it cannot exceed 25% of the full and fair cash value. Okay, so it's a lot of uh, calculations. And again, just like Chapter 61A, the landowner has to actually enroll the October before the next fiscal year. Okay? Yes? Yeah, quick question. Um, 61, I, well, is 61A and 61B, are they both um, essentially managed by the state or the town? My the understanding state. was that the um, 61B is something that the state the town can actually manage. This, the state manages it. Yeah. Uh, they work with our assessors, though. Uh -huh. I mean, there has to be obviously a lot of collaboration as to what the valuation is. Right. But really, it's all the state. Mm -hmm. So a plan, when a plan is set up for 61B or A, it has to go through you, through the town, and then it the goes state to the state. Again. The state certifies no. exactly. Wait, no, is some does the conservation? the local conservation commission have any role in 61B monitoring? I don't know that. Okay. I don't think so, but I've heard that question. in some towns that that is the case. That's a good question. I know we monitor our own open space. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then the question comes, yes. It sure looks to me like the state is really encouraging the preservation of open space. Sure. Uh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, if you go to the next slide, you'll see all of the encouragement for permanent open space. So you have conservation restrictions that can be put onto a property. That is for permanent protection. Uh, for farmland, we in Stowe actually have recently had agricultural preservation restrictions put on the farmland, restricting it to agricultural use. The landowner can actually donate or even sell the property to a land trust. So whether it's someone like uh, the Stowe Conservation Trust or a regional trust like Sudbury Valley Trustees, people do sell their land under that trust and the trust will protect it. Usually that is also accompanied by a conservation restriction that's held by a separate party. Uh, you can't have both. It's just the way it works. Speak up if I'm misspeaking. Okay. Uh, another way of protecting land permanently is to get a <laughs> Community Preservation Act funded specifically for this purpose. If you are buying land with CPA funds for open space and recreation, then you actually have a deed restriction on that. It's purchased with CPA land. 
Now you can have a regular deed restriction on property. It's not in perpetuity. I think that you can max it at 30 years, but it is a longer term way of protecting land. So there are alternatives. And the state does encourage people, and especially local land trusts encourage people to p use one of these measures if you want to protect land permanently. Okay? All right. Very quickly, when an owner enrolls in a Chapter 61 program, there's a lot of rights and obligations that the landowner has. So first of all, every program has its own form, <laughs> lots of forms. So we were talking about how it gets actually worked. You go through the state, it includes qualifications, it includes applications forms. They have that lien that I talked about earlier. They recognize the fact that the municipality has the option to purchase should the use change. And they understand about the penalty tax appeals and abatements, plus any of the other fees that they may have to pay if they withdraw early, the conveyance fees. Okay? On the other flip side, when land goes into Chapter 61, the town has some legal obligations. You know, a landowner can take their property and put it into a Chapter 61 program. The land doesn't, or the town doesn't really have the right to say no, but the town does have legal obligations when that happens. So the town must waive or exercise its first right of refusal to purchase any of the classified land when the use changes. We have to do that by law. We have to respond within 120 days. And there are all kinds of caveats around, oh, you can be hand-delivered, it should be postmarked, all that good stuff. If, I mentioned this before, if we do exercise our option of right, first right of refusal, we really can't negotiate. We have to step into a buyer's shoes using their exact same term. We can't say we don't like that price, we want to offer less. We can't say we don't like that price, we want to offer more doesn't matter. We <laughs> can step in under a bona fide offer, something that already exists with the seller. We have 120 days. That can be ne negotiated with the landowner should the landowner agree. So if you be, oh, well, maybe we need another week. Well, okay, we can do that. But, but that's up to the landowner. By default, we're restricted to the 120 days. And we can't touch any land that's not in a Chapter 61 program. So if you have a parcel where part of it is under Chapter 61 and part of it is not, we can't do anything with the part that is not. We can only address the part that is in the program. Does that make sense? Okay. Good enough. Uh, we touched on this at the very beginning. How does the town deal with this? Well, first of all, we try to track what our Chapter 61 land is. I know the Conservation Commission and the Open Space and Recreation uh, Committees actually update their plans. They look at Chapter 61 land. They prioritize it. In fact, uh, there was a land use task force that created a report that the Board of Selectmen approved back in 2008. It was updated in 2009 and reviewed in 2011. They actually said, here is the Chapter 61 lands that we think have the most potential. But that is, again, under the context of open space and recreation. SMOT is a completely different use from what it is already being used for. So we really were advised not to do that. So we have to respond a little reactively, whereas the other organizations can be a little more proactive. And I think that was your question at the very beginning. So I the land- that you can't actually analyze the land. Have you set up the parameters that actually would define what makes land suitable for SMOT? Isn't it actually, we have. As a matter of fact, we have. <laughs> 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 That's exactly right. Do I even have a slide on that? Uh, um, yeah. Lots yeah. of questions. Yeah. I'm sorry. It, it just seems to me that there's, there's a paradox here. The paradox is that, on one hand, there is a program, the, the, the clear intent of a program, the clear intent of which is to preserve open land, okay? Um, on the other hand, apparently, this, this, this law has a feature in it which gives you the right, the town, not you, the town, the right of, first of all, to purchase, not only to purchase, which is the part we haven't covered yet. This is the, we haven't gotten into the heart of the matter, if I may say so. 
that allows the town to purchase the land and do with it the exact opposite of what the intent was of the law, which is to create, to use that property for multiple. Mm -hmm. By the way, I note that I'm not using the term affordable housing, I'm hey. using the term multiple housing, which is the, the crux of the matter. Because a lot of this, a lot of a lot of discussion has been we to spend more than an hour now discussing affordable housing. The issue I, th I think for most of us that are concerned about this is not affordable housing, it's multiple housing, which is essentially turning the whole program on its, on its head from, from an intent of preserving open space to creating multiple housing. And that's the paradox and to some extent the contradiction of this, of this, yeah. of this, of this, <laughs> of this particular program and, and frankly something which all of us and I would bet anyone who's put its land on the 61A did not realize that they're swallowing a, a poison pill, so to speak. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I do say that there are alternative tools in place for permanent protection, and that should have been investigated. The town does not have a right to buy the plant unless it's being withdrawn from the program. Correct. The act that starts it is the withdrawal of the of the land from that program, and so, as much as we might like to think, there are often there's a there's a you know there'll be an empty lot next to your house, and you say, I love having this empty lot next to my house, and then you find out that somebody bought it, and they're going to build a house there, and there's nothing you can do about it. This is not this is a situation where, if this land was kept in the in in the program, there we would not be sitting here. But the, the landowner notified the town that they were removing this property, which means that they were going to change use. If they didn't mean to change use, there would be no reason to withdraw from the program. So there was going to, there, the use was going to change. And we have not decided in terms of the number of units or anything else. Right now we're deciding whether to buy property. At some point, we are going to bring a, a committee together if that, if the town meeting decides to do that, we will decide, we'll go through this. We will get a group of concerned citizens such as yourselves and other folks to decide what is the best way to go forward with that land. So I there's really no proposal. Ingeborg Please. wanted to say well, something. I just wanted to say this is really a landowner controlled process. The landowner chooses to change the use. So, mm -hmm. and then the town by law has to respond to that change in use. So I understand the intent of a land owner to put something to ch into chapter for the purposes of protection for the part, the area, the subjects that we discussed. But then ultimately, it's the landowner's choice to change the use, and that's when the town's 120-day clock starts. Okay, and good. in this in this particular instance, the the change of use was she has to sell the land, and she's selling it to a builder. The end result of that would be one house on that lot, not multiple. Potentially. Potentially. But there's, there's no, no guarantee. guarantee. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. It's guaranteed according to the... <laughs> no. No, it's not guaranteed. No, it's, it's not. not. If, they're, if, they're bought, if they bought adjacent lands... It's, 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 it's a one house lot. <laughs> I, I will defer. I will defer to our, <laughs> our, I'm just our former town planner. Maybe that's the plan for one house, but well, it's not guaranteed. It was permitted. It was permitted. It was permitted. It was permitted. <sighs> Special permit. But that could one be. That one could, house. It could be resold again, and you could have somebody come in and propose something else. Mm -hmm. Right. The planning board approved right. a permit and they that can, says and right, that it's a hammerhead lot for one that, house. That, that's a permit, but it's not saying that's only the only thing that can happen. It's not an if and only if, if from a logical perspective. Basically. It's saying if then. If you want to build this, you're permitted. But it's not saying that's the only thing that can happen. So, so this land could be combined. So for example, land. the end of my street is a big parcel and it was permitted to build 20 houses, but they never did it. So now they're coming back with a different plan and another application to get a different permit. The same thing could happen on this parcel. So it happens all the time. I'd like the to just suggest that which, this, which this particular parcel, the Hammerhead lot, has a driveway with an easement onto our property. We'll get to that. We'll get there. That is, that is we'll get there. Difference. We'll get there. So I, I, I would there? like to just say that although you may have felt that this past hour was not that helpful, there are people in the public that have learned a lot from this presentation. We understand. And I would like to recommend that we continue this. There will be more rules, but at this point, we are 
diverting the conversation to this one lot. I think what we'd like to do is to <laughs> continue the, 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 the title of The title of this presentation <laughs> yes, and was 241 bucks for a I know, lot. and we will get there. I just think we're cutting right. through right. a lot of things. Right. Okay. It's Are there restrictions thing. on the use? Are there restrictions on what the town can use this, the property for? Hmm? The town has the right to review it for any municipal need, period. Okay, Okay, so next slide. You have to have proper notice to the town. That's what triggers the 120 days. And so if there is an incomplete notification, it doesn't, the clock doesn't start until all of these notices, all these points here are met. And that's what entitles proper notice. You'll notice the one at number five where it's underlined and now blown up. We have to have a bona fide offer. The purchase and sale agreement may not be dependent upon potential changes to current zoning or conditions or contingencies relating to the potential for or the potential extent of subdivision of the property for residential use or the potential for or the potential extent of development of the property for industrial or commercial use. So we can't factor that in as part of uh, the offer. We can only accept what the original offer is. The town does have the right to review it for municipal use. Once we get the proper notification, that kicks off a Chapter 61 process that was approved by the Board of Selectmen again in 2008 updated in 2011 of notification. It was approved where the town boards and committees are notified, solicited. We gather information to see what we know about the property, what we do need to know about the property, and whether there is interest across the town in this specific case. Yes? Mike, can we go back on the slide? Sure. So with the right of first refusal, the town steps into the shoes of the current buyer Correct. who's already Correct. made the offer on the property Correct. and meets the same criteria in the purchase and sale agreement, which cannot be subject to subdivisions of the property for residential use. Right. However, the town can change that, so the town then does not meet the same criteria of the purchase and sale agreement well, what if the town th intends to subdivide the property for what residential That's use. That's a lot. Right. There's, what they're saying is, is that there can't be, in, in the offer, there can't be contingencies about what potentially would happen. It's not saying that the buyer, the original buyer, who's going to set those things, can't say, I'm only going to buy this if this and this happens. And so it's not really, it's not talking about change, it's saying that there can't be contingencies within the offer that, that it's more about, it's not saying about, about change of use as much as saying about there's a contingency in the offer that says, well, I'm only going to pay if this happens because then since the town is an actor, and the reason that is that's to avoid conflict of interest right. because the town's an actor in that permitting process, so the town would have a conflict of interest of having to step up and buy a property that they would have, they would be making a decision on. So that, that just, it's made so that it's keep that separate. Yeah. So if the town's use has the same conflict of interest, where they are then depending on being able to subdivide the property. How is that not the same contradiction? Well, it's not saying that you can't subdivide the property. It's saying you can't make as a contingency of the offer subdivision of the property. Right. So which once is the not town buys the property, mm -hmm. then they, they meet all the requirements of the purchase right. and sale. And then after that, the town can follow the rest of its laws it's and buy right. it. Right. It, it, says it, it just says it may not be dependent upon the future subdivision. It, it's so you, it's a long sentence, and with all those commas, you could lose the context. But what it's saying is they have to have a bona fide offer that is not dependent on any one of those. If those were bullets, it wouldn't be clearer. So if I, if I could talk ahead. about the, the, the process. I was yeah. on the land use task force, actually, years ago when this, when this group, uh, when this was put together. And the reason we did this is twofold. One is because at that time there were quite a number of chapter lands that were coming up, and they were coming up, and we were having. There was what year? One year we had six town meetings. I think we had six town meetings uh, about about chapter lands, and so we realized that we were. And often, what happened? There was two things that happened. One is that developers would put net would put 
very onerous um, clauses, conditions in their in their purchase that would make it so that the town would not just couldn't in 120 days even evaluate what was going on, um, and and also that it made it very difficult for us to um, to re respond. In a, in a, if, if you had, you know, like for instance, we got this, and then we got next week, we got another one. We may have another town meeting in, in October. So the idea was was the idea was to was to compress and 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 make a a, a clear process so that we could go through and evaluate very quickly if do we have interest or we not. Most of the time, we don't have interest. It costs too much, just from a cost perspective. Most of the time, when chapter lands come up, they're very large, and we can and the town can't afford it. It's five million dollars, and we don't have it. It, it's 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 money that can't and, and that's just that's just the way it is. That's I mean pretty much I mean I think in the before two thousand six I think we had three or four of them and, and we could, just couldn't afford any of them. There was some that we actually very much would have liked. We there was a whole discussion about land banking and such um, about about buying land that we might want to have in the future, but we just couldn't afford it. They were just too expensive. So the idea was is this process was mostly to weed out stuff that we didn't want to spend a lot of time on. And to make sure that we could very quickly, by getting the first step, which was having the staff look into things uh, first, um, that we could weed out those situations where the the offer had a lot of complexity or a lot of conditions on it that we, we couldn't deal with. So that that's why this process came came to be is mostly to be able to weed out the ones where we said, well, there's no way we can we can afford this or this is too complicated. We can't possibly address this in 120 days. So I just want to know. Thank you. Uh, we could be here all night just talking about Chapter 61, and I know you guys want to move on. You want to move on. So there are a couple of resources oh. in the slides. Uh, almost every site references two documents in particular. Uh, one is this overview here, Chapter 61 programs, that talks about what they are. And there's a page, page 17, I believe, that talks about the town's right of first refusal and what that process is. I was right. Page 17. Yeah. Uh, that's sad. <laughs> yeah, that's sad. <laughs> and then uh, there's another document. Uh, and again, right. these are all live links. So you can just click on them when we put this out. You can get them yourselves. That's really designed for the municipality that talks about Chapter 61 programs and the town or city's obligation and how you have to respond. So I think those are two really, really helpful documents. I know there was a lot of misperception at one of the selectmen's meetings where some of the attendees thought it was land that was given to the town. Some people thought there was a permanent restriction on the land. Uh, and so I just want to make sure everyone understands what these programs are all about thank you all right um, I don't think we, we probably talked about all this stuff before this has been on previous uh, presentations but uh, essentially the, the the key point is that we're doing is land suitable for the stated purpose and we're trying to understand what's 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 possible on the land and not making any proposals about what would currently what what currently is 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 the right thing to do or what might happen in the future so to get, again, we, these are the parcels in question. We're now getting to the, into the specifics. Uh, again, we're not talking about the, the, uh, the house that there's an offer on, but it's the back part of that parcel, number two, and all of the hammerhead parcel on number three. I um, wanted to thank Valerie, who's our new um, assistant planner, for putting this together for me today, because I, I thought it would be good to put in context here um, this is the Flag Hill um, land, which is open space, permanently protected. This is the um, the proposed AAN. Was that was it Regents? Now Regents. It used to be Ridgewood. Now they're going to oh, okay. Regents. Well, for now it's Regency. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and again, you directly across the street, as you can see. And I think the 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 access is here, but I don't know. I have no idea where the access well, is going to be. Just marked it today, and it's pretty much across the street from. And these are the and, and these are the and these are the the, the parcels in, in question. Just to just to put in context the where we are. So for I know I'm pretty sure that all you folks know where this is, <laughs> but folks watching on TV they may want to know exactly where we're talking about. This is the uh, this is Boxborough Road, Taylor Road, Packard Road coming across here, West Acton Road, it's right there. Um, um, Treffery Lane, and I can't remember what the name of that 
Is that Patriots? Is that Patriots? Does that actually show the other lands that are in the uh, well, like helping us? Yeah. Conservation land. Conservation restrictions, etc. Like my property and the pond there. No, this was it just 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 for a, a large scale in terms of just he showing the. You could do that because it really shows the inappropriateness of this development abutting, taking up preserved land. You should do that the town meeting, please. Which, the, the, is this is separate from the, this? No, no, your map. map. The map that we had here? The map isn't inclusive. It doesn't show conservation restrictions like around Mrs. Ward Pond. It doesn't show Sorrell's land. It doesn't sh show Okay. My I property, for example, he's had metal book restrictions. It's a good suggestion. We can do that for the we can do that for town meeting. Um, I was mostly trying to put this in context of where it is in town and what is what's close to it. It's not but it doesn't include enough. But it doesn't include enough. You say so um, I wrote it out. You've written it you've written it down. We will do this. We will sit down with planning board and, and have a better slide for the town meeting. So thank you for the for the suggestion. Well the book is on there, but I need to place it There's a pond. Mm -hmm. We call that fresh upon it. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can put a couple of different layers on. We can yeah. put the natural resources and open yeah. space, and that's yeah. easily placed on that. Okay. So these were, uh, and I talked with, uh, we were talking amongst ourselves and wanted to show, the, the engineering studies we got were for, were for one, was for a concept plan for just parcel three and for the two. And to, Point out, and people, have, this is this is causes a lot of consternation when we talk about there being multiple units. And yes, this shows six units on that parcel, and this shows 12 units on this parcel. The reason that is is that's what we asked the engineers to do. We didn't ask them. There, this isn't a design. This isn't a proposal. We asked the engineers to say, from a concept, from a conceptual point of view, what can this land support? What is the maximum? No one. I, well, I wouldn't say no one in their right mind because there might be <laughs> someone in the right mind. But no one who is, I think, is going to have something to say about this is going to say that this is an appropriate use of this land. This is not appropriate for this part of the town. It's just, it's, it's. I would say it's not high density because high density on the state is eight units per acre, which we're not talking so, about. So I, I but need to comment on that. So high density and still, yep. is any housing that is more than one home per acre and a half. We are not so in Boston. A lot right. lots so here are not 0.1 acre right. per home. Yes. So, so, so try to get where you are located. You are right. in Stowe. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are there are a number there are a number of there are a number of developments that have that kind of density. Uh, there. But we have two two issues going on. One is is that the the town has clearly stated that. The higher density is, when we say high density, we're talking about, um, f well, the state defense, defi uh, defines high density as eight units per acre. But, but no, when, you are in uh, Stowe, I, yeah. right? I've just, you just if, talked about earlier. If, if, you, could, if no. you could please Wait, let me like finish the point. Now, you've asked your question, you've repeated your question. I understand that. So we're saying high density, when we say by the, by the state, is eight units per acre. We're not talking about that. We're talking, however, about much higher density than we normally have in Stowe, and certainly certainly higher than the average density. So that type of density just doesn't make any, you're right, it makes no sense in this town. But the point is, for these pictures, is that what we've asked the, 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 the engineers to do is to say, what could this land? And the point is, is not that this is what's been proposed or anyone would think this. The idea is, is that we, we our job is to see what is Kate what is possible on this land to make sure that it's a good value to buy so if you can put 12 you can put three no no that's not the point no no but okay so now there are questions mm -hmm. so let's start from that side and work our way to this one. yes it's related to when you ask them what's possible based on what on Just pretty drawings no. or on digging into the land to see what's underneath What's possible based on what criteria? The criteria is, is that we ask them for in terms of it's it's being able to spot the well, the septic, and the appropriate setbacks. So what happens underneath those the ground? Three items then those are, three. I believe, the three items that we look at at this level. The next level is, which is hopefully going to happen next week, is they actually are going to dig under the ground, 
and they're going to tell us what can happen. And that will change that number. But essentially, what you're doing in a conceptual plan is just saying, looking at where's the well, where's the septic need to go, and make sure you have the appropriate setbacks for all those stuff, and the setbacks from all the other stuff. How many, what can be done there? So if you put 12 there, you can put two there. And I'd say that we're going to be a lot closer to two than 12. But they base putting a well just sort of on a random with the, or an educated well, guess? How do they decide? With this, let's put the well here. Well, sometimes there's, in this, case, in this case, there was information from previous, um, if, that you would well know about. Mm -hmm. There was previous, you know, previous studies uh, about percolation tests on, on this property made some assumptions about that of the similarity of the perk of, of the ability to perk and that's what those are and the setbacks here um, so there again this type of thing takes a long time usually this this kind of proposal would take you know, months to pull together and that's not appropriate what we want to see here is what is there any we're looking again for deal breakers is there is the, is is it not possible to build on this property though and that's what we're looking for and then the idea is, is that we're trying to set an upper limit as about what could be done. Obviously, if you can build 12, you can build 3. Or you can build, if you build 12, you can build 9. So anything below that is, is possible. So that's, it's based on a concept plan, not anything else. I would else. also say it's also based on bedrooms. You're right. thinking mm -hmm. units, but think in terms of bedrooms. So mm -hmm. if you were to build on a hammerhead lot, you could probably put a four or five bedroom home with an accessory apartment with another bedroom or two by right. Mm -hmm. Okay? So seven, we're talking seven, seven bedrooms. We were so five five right. You could. You one could. Bedroom. By right. We were told we on could. a hammerhead well, lot, you could that. do that. But, the, but, that's, but the, what's currently permitted, if I understand correctly, <laughs> is an up to five bedroom house right. with up to two bedrooms as an accessory apartment. So, right. so accessory seven apartments are, are allowed by right. For that. It's part and of that's just this property. And that's just this yes, property. Yes, it's in our zoning bylaw. Yes, it's in our zoning bylaws. That's right. So but that's in this. That's just for this property. Yeah. So, so, right. so the idea would be. So we're talking already by default. Just looking at that one parcel, you could do seven bedrooms. And if you look at just the prior, I think it was the prior slide. Oops, sorry. We're talking Oops. about maybe two or three units that are one and two bedrooms. We're not talking about anything significantly different from what could be developed by right. Sure. Sure. So I, it, it's, it 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 it's <laughs> but in terms of bedrooms, in terms of no, septic and water. are going to have seven bedrooms total? That doesn't make sense. No, 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 no. no. What no. I'm saying is if you look at just right. that parcel alone, right. we were talking about handful of smaller units with one and two bedrooms. Yes. So maybe you're also talking about a cul-de-sac instead of a driveway. So we are looking, the question about was about septic and water draw on the local water well. table than a, one well. You're talking about a much bigger septic system to serve six, 10, 12 bedrooms than for no. one house. No, yes. because it's based on bedrooms. It's based on bedrooms. So bedrooms. septics are based seven on bedrooms, bedrooms, not on yes. doorways. So you're going to have seven. Mm -hmm one bedroom units. Then no, I did not say that. So you're gonna I have said two, if you three. look at what we could potentially do mm -hmm. and what was shown just on parcel three, it's not that different from what you could do by right. Yes, Except for putting on roads. So there's so terms so of the number of folks, bedrooms. Folks, we need to, we need to, there is enough, now we are talking about the maximum that could be put here. No, no, and that's the reason. Yes, that's why. We're that talking is what about skewed interpretation of what's allowed, and linking that to your current proposal. There is no current proposal. There is no proposal. There is no current proposal. The idea is the proposal here is to buy some land, okay, and then bring a group together to decide what's the right thing to do with it. So, so and could we put housing there? And could that's we put all. housing there? So the idea here is to is to just look at this land and say, is housing possible there? Now I know that looking at that and saying, I live here, and there could be 12 houses back here, is suboptimal and pretty scary. But the point yeah. is, is that this is not a decision that's going to be made without input from the community. Right. Done. The, what are you going to present at town meeting? Right. 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 Yeah. That potential town meeting to vote on? That's what they're voting on. The, right. the, the point is, again, is that there? No one is proposing anything with this slide. I think the well, way we have to. I think you're raising an excellent point. Yes. 
And I think the way we have to look at this, because I'm relatively new to this process, and I'm listening to this as if I was the public, and I'm listening to what you're saying. And I think in SMOT's defense here, they're doing their due diligence, and they're being totally transparent about what they're doing. And well, I think this is pretty transparent to come to a neighborhood, show a shared driveway that's going to provide access to 12 units. That's pretty transparent. The transparency isn't the part I have an issue with. Okay, well then let me finish. Okay, so let me finish. So I think I'd like to explore what your suggestion is in terms of presenting this to the public. You know, Good idea. because what the town, what SMART has to do is do its due diligence. Right. This is due diligence. That's that's. I know you disagree with me, but what we have to, or you, I'm not saying all of you, but I just saw your face, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, it's a due diligence exercise that goes through various conceptual plans, and perhaps what we need to do for purposes of town meeting, and I'm new, so I could be sticking my foot in my mouth, is to show due diligence wise, we can afford to put in the wells that will draw. Uh, 115 gallons per bedroom, so that would allow blah blah blah. But then also go down to the lower end, you know, to see because right. because as we've been saying, this could be one or two units or three units. Yes. The other thing that I suggest yes. is for your guys' perspective to have that shared driveway there is pretty scary. And I asked the question, where's that coming from? And apparently that's from the current that there was a concern at the time of the permitting that there not be too many driveways in line. You know, I'm sympathetic to the issues that have been raised that, yes, SMOT has to look at bedrooms, sewage disposal, wells. The residents have to look at traffic and noise and, you know, that kind of thing. And I appreciate the fact that you're talking about density and not affordability. Um, so I think that's something we have to explore so a little bit as part of our... Right. And, and I, I'd say the... An issue is that between now and August 8th, when we're going to vote on this, the kind of information and the kind of work that needs to be done to give the town the type of proposal that it deserves is, is just not going to happen in that period of time. This takes months and it takes input from a lot of different people. So that's following all my questions. You're asking voters, like myself, but to, to vote on potentially a little city back there. With a large city, plus. But, so what are you going to come to town meeting? Two units to 13 units? That isn't fair to the voters. Because the voters are going to take our sympathy and consideration a little bit. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But and what we would like to come to, I'm sorry. So frankly, I mean, the, the town warrant has two things on it, right? When we buy the land and the CPC provide 40000 plus 40000 That's it. Right. That's right. That's and that's and at this stage, that's voting. exactly what we can do. How can an informed voter make sure? The form here says is. Eight acres at $180,000, <coughs> an appropriate value for the town. Hell, I guess I'll buy it for that. Right. <laughs> but you get what you pay for. There's a reason it's priced so low. The $40,000, 4.17 acres is landlocked. Nobody else can do anything with it. Correct. The Hammerhead lot, lot three, as it's known in the documentation, where your current picture has its little cul-de-sac, has extreme ledge issues. It's been on the market at fair market value for over a year. Mm -hmm. Nobody can build on it. Everyone else has figured that out, and that's why it's being sold for roughly oh, half right, right. of its price, mm -hmm. of its market well, rate. Maybe the, the subsurface exploration will identify that. I but don't know. But the <laughs> 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 take to organize that. Yeah. Must be that's been on that property. Since so this property has April. this yeah. property has had exploratory work on it. This work is going to be scheduled. It was supposed to be scheduled last week. It's been pushed out, and I just got the, the documentation that I'm supposed to sign a permit for something for hmm. next week, right? Hmm. So, um, so that that's f what will happen on this parcel back there. Um, Mike? Yes. Yes, yeah. we did do some of that exploration when we developed the lot. We also developed lot two. That's the residence of the uh, Torredensons. Did I get it right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
the builder who bought that particular lot found it extremely difficult to build. It was offered to him, the, the hammerhead was offered to him, and he said, no thank you. So there is some experience and some history, some knowledge, that in fact it's Right. You know, it's and, and the difference that, that may be there possible. between that is that somebody who's trying to buy a house and make money on it versus yeah. somebody who's trying to buy a house and essentially knowingly going to lose money on it, which is what well, you, you do in affordable housing. You're building affordable housing. We're building affordable housing, we're building affordable housing and, and we know we're going to lose money on it. It's just a matter of how much money is going to lose. So there is but we're not trying to turn a profit on it, which is no. what a, which is what a, a developer would try to do. No. Courtney? Yeah. I, just, I just wanted to throw out there for a moment that look at what SMOT has to deal with. They're trying for our town right. to help us keep our taxes low, not have overdevelopment, and they constantly have lousy pieces of land and insurmountable tasks to try and put an affordable unit or two. You know, I mean, they're stuck with the worst job yeah, in the world besides the garbage truck driving. <laughs> 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 you actually raised a really good point yeah. on that. So, you know, you think in, in this instance that there would be a, a bigger plan as a consequence of the exercise with 323 Great Road. So you guys did do a cost analysis for that. Yes. How much that would cost. Mm -hmm. And your selectman turned you down. That was a land that the town had already paid for because it was, you know, so outrageously expensive. So what, you, what is your reason. thought process that... We go to the next one. And we keep go going for the, one. For the chapter but 61 but land. But as a consequence of that, it is a minimum respect for the voters to show the voters when you come up there, there's a plan that we are not buying another parcel of land that we're going to turn into something we have no idea what we're going to do with. You can't come up to voters and say, let's buy this on a hope and dream of that we can turn it into something. Well, we just walk on to the we next partial. We've already done that. We did that in 2015. In 14, you got turned down there because of the cost. It was not. And I that's don't know much necessarily more that. Land. And, 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 and one of our select men here. So here maybe you can respond to that. If, if I might, please. I was on the board of selectmen that requested proposals once we owned that land. It was bought originally for a potential site for a fire station. Absolutely. When a better plan came along for that. We then had the options at exploring what we could do with it. One of the, the option that was concerned, uh, con applied was some affordable housing unit and other or the park land concept. When we actually did a walk through, it's one thing to look at a layout on paper. But the Board of Selectmen, myself and all of us, did a walk through with the committee that put together the proposals, including Mike was there right. showing him, this was where the housing units would be, or this is how it would, at one point it was going to be combined with uh, some few units plus the park area. It was not a choice that I felt as a member, I'm not speaking for the entire board, but when I decided the way I was going to vote on that, sitting at that table, it was having looked at that, I did not see that that land was it, it couldn't have been used in concert with the parkland because of a number of, of topographical factors that the best use of that land, in my opinion, and concurred in by my colleagues uh, on the board as it was then constituted, was the town had spoken clearly that they wanted a park-type setting to, to in the, near the center of town. Uh, it, that it provided open space, it, it access and, it, to the center. It was it was seen as the highest best use for that parcel. And, and I believe that the idea that a park, if we needed that land sometime in the future, to put another municipal building there for some reason, or a park is a lot easier to build over than houses. But we're also protecting a well, a well yeah, potential so well site. If, if the town. Right. 100 years from now, so wants to put in a, a, a So it's a very, very different situation. But it was not that we turned down because it was too costly. It was that the overall best interest in our, consistent with the open space plan and a lot of people's input after a lot of hearings uh, was what we approved and it's what's moving forward. So what is that land being used for today? Karen, can you 
identify the, so the last, way it's moving forward? Last week forward? we walked by there, we saw a lot of trash. It's a, it's a dumping ground. Yeah, there's, I right. believe the Recreation Commission and the Conservation Commission are working on the path plan now. Uh -huh. the they, they are meeting with both, they have met recently with both the First Parish Church and the Union mm -hmm. Church, mm -hmm. who are both very interested in seeing that park land develop. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it is not lying fallow. There is a process being developed which takes time. It will be within my lifetime. <laughs> and <laughs> and hopefully well before that. It's used for the higher purpose. Mike, could you walk us through the scenario if the town at, at our town meeting votes to exercise the right of first refusal? If it's a yes vote, what will then happen? If it's a no vote, what will then happen? That's a great, that's a great Mike, suggestion. While you're on the topic, can you include what happens if they vote yes to purchase but no to the CBA funding? Because um, okay. they are two separate articles. Good. So while we're running Correct, through, although the, the articles have, the, the Warren articles have changed since probably the last time you saw them, because they almost changed since the last time I saw them. So they've been constant flux. But uh, <laughs> we've just talked about it this uh, afternoon on the phone, so I, I think that they're done. But. Um, sure. So, so there'll be a town meeting on August 8th if the town meeting, which is the legislative body of the town, decides that this is uh, a purchase that um, the town wants to make, the, we would exercise, the town would uh, let the landowner know that we're going to exercise the option and the, we have then 100, no, 60 days, I believe, 60 days to um, to actually complete the transaction. Um, and we, the, from the SMOT side, we would, uh, at $200,000, we have to get a vote from, $200,000 above for purchase of land, we have to get a, a vote from the, a binding vote from the selectmen. For under $200,000, we need advisory votes from both the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee to just lay it out front of so we have some so that there's other people besides the trust looking at this and just giving us advice about whether this is a good use of funds, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, then the, and so then SMOT and those two groups would, with affirmative votes and all that stuff, then we would be able to use those, the trust funds to be able to buy one portion of it if, and again, that is if the, s if the first part fails and we don't, then we would probably vote no at, we would move no action on the second one for the CPA funding, that would make sense. There's no reason to encumber CPA funding if we're not going to buy anything. So if the, so the, the, the way the articles are written is such that there's flexibility in terms of the way that the property would be paid for, it would have the opportunity to use SMOT funds, CPC funds, and I believe the wording is, or any other funds. Mike. Um, yes. The way, um, the way it reads, to see if the town will vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to exercise its Is that today's version? No. I All right, so that's yeah. 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 completely right. changed. No, that's wrong. It's completely so changed. So my question right. is, um, right. if the town votes to authorize the, the exercise of right. the right of first refusal, mm -hmm. is, do we have to? If we, if we, do we have to purchase it? Does the town have to purchase it if we do future research and find that in fact it's n not going to be workable? Um, so what? So we the have vote sixty days. Yes, just giving in that us sixty that days. If there was some reason in sixty, essentially we have we have to ninety let days. Ninety days. Sorry, um, we have to tell the landowner that we intend to exercise the option, okay. and then have to close within ninety days. Okay. Um, if in that 90 days something happened and we didn't close, and, and there was some reason not to close, mm -hmm. uh, I'd believe that it just all goes back, and then we would say, oh no, never mind, we're gonna waive. Mm -hmm. And then that proceeds. Okay. So that would, that, pretty sure that's what happens okay. there. Um, the situation where the first article would be approved and the second article wouldn't be approved is, um, I, it's possible. I believe that the moderator, I have not spoken in great detail, but in s former situations in town when these types of articles go together that are kind of married, 
they, they tend to be argued and discussed together and usually voted on one after the other. Like, you know, all the discussion happens on all of them and you vote on one mm -hmm. and you vote on the other. So my question is hypothetically, if if the town is granted the, the if the Board of Selectmen via the townspeople is right. asked to continue with the right of first refusal and acquire the land, yes. but for whatever reason, the townspeople don't want to spend their CPA funds on it or CPC funds, right. um, does SMOT have the ability or the, the funding to then still continue with the purchase? Um, Taking into account closing costs, the engineering work it's you said you've already scheduled. I'm not. I think that remains to be seen. Okay. I don't. I don't know. <coughs> I don't believe. I don't believe we. You know, if, if we used every cent, it's possible. I think we would. You would. We, there would be if if something like that were to happen. I think there would be a lot of uh, very frenetic motion all at once, and the town council would be involved, and there'd be people running around, and I, I think we'd be trying to so. You know, thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> I'll start thinking about it. <laughs> I, I, I won't. I won't sleep, but I'll think about it. Uh, That's your problem. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Right. But, uh, <laughs> right. Let me Done. add to my. And thank you for agreeing. We have to have a more comprehensive map. Um, it seems to me you owe the voters in this situation. It's quite emotional, especially people around here. Sure. A better plan as to what is going to go there. You can't say two. To 12 or show a little on the big one. You're really asking us to vote on a set number of pieces, which I would vote against because 12 is too many. Can I, can I ask? You see what I'm saying? Please. Would you vote yes if you were then on the committee that I think Mike has talked about? That would, I hadn't gotten to that, that part would of the be process formed. yet. If the vote is yes, there will be a community group. <laughs> no, there would be a community group to look at that property, the no. issues there, and all anyone here would have that opportunity to put input into. You're what? asking to respond on public TV. I don't know if I no. would if I was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to respond. On <laughs> yes. But we'll Mike, why don't you say? We'll be able to run the tape and say we volunteered. Why don't you? Why don't you talk right, about so, that? Right. So so let's say so let's let's get let's say let's say the the funding happens. Um, that we would let the the town know we buy we buy the property through whatever funding source we, we would, then uh, the recommendation of SMUT, and we've had preliminary conversations, this would be something that we would discuss with the selectmen and discuss with the town administrator, would be to create a committee, and that could be a subcommittee of SMUT, it could be a committee that's formed by the selectmen. Uh, we haven't really discussed exactly how that would work yet, uh, but the intention would be to have a committee of people that would work who would be some of the folks possibly the people in this room, also citizens that are not abutters, for instance, or not live close, close by to have the same sort of um, same sort of perspective, except not as a not as a near neighbor. Um, we'd try to look for some from folks for, with technical expertise, maybe somebody from SMOT, somebody from either the planning board or a member or associate, somebody in that regard, somebody looking who's got experience in design, maybe somebody who's got design, uh, some experience in building to discuss what's the appropriate use now that we have this land. What's the appropriate use of that um, property? And, you know, my opinion does not matter. I'm not making any proposals. I don't have any other opinion. I would, I would, I would vote against 12 units on that parcel. I would vote against eight units on that parcel. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. It's not the right thing to do for that neighborhood. And that's, I'm just saying, I'm not speaking for the, for the, for SMOT, I'm not speaking for anybody else. I'm saying I would, I would vote against those things. And, what we need to, what would that group would need to look at was in terms of what we can afford, how many units could go there to have the, the, the minimal impact on everyone, but particularly on the folks in this room, the butters, and, 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 and but also be cost effective. And, to, to sh and, and they're going to need to strike a balance between what can be spent on per unit because the fewer units you build, the more expensive each one of those units is versus what the impact is on the, on, on, on abutters. And I would think that that would be a relatively small number in my, in my estimation. So 
is there any, I mean, I, I don't know that there's anything else that I, at this point, any number that is thrown out is, is equally irrelevant as any other number that's thrown out until that group sits down and looks at those numbers, looks at that situation, and looks at what's the right thing to do there. And I, again, this is, I mean, I think this is a different kind of situation from when you have a developer who comes in from outside, kind of helicopters in and says, I want to do this on this property. This is something that's going to be done by the town, with town input, by the community. It's going to be a community, this is going to be community housing. And from that perspective, the folks, everyone in town who has something to say about it needs to be heard. And I, I don't know how to do it any more fairly than that. Question? <laughs> Everybody's got a question on that one. I, said, I guess, I hope all of you do have a better way. So. <laughs> well, let's jump ahead a little bit and suppose all of this planning and this committee exercises all of it and you all of a sudden you develop issues that you hadn't foreseen on, on topographical issues, ledge, uh, expense per unit. Can't, can't afford it. I'd say we can't we, afford it. By the time you spent six months diligently studying this thing because now you said, okay, we're not on the 120 day. We right. own it for that period of time. We can't use it for what you want to use it for. What happens then? There's, um, if the two parcels would be slightly different depending on how they were, the, the parcel that was bought with smart money could be resold on the market. Um, it could be sold at a loss, it could break even, or it, we could sell it for more if the market goes up in that, in that time. It could be that some of the work that was done in the meeting time made it, made it made more valuable, who knows. Um, but that, that could, some of that money could be recouped, and, but all the proceeds from that sale would have to be used for affordable housing in a town style. The other parcel, if CPC funds are used, they're going to be used with unreserved funds, and what would most likely happen, the town would own that, and they, you know, we could sell that land too, but it would be have to be sold with a restriction on it for either affordable housing, historical, or open space, and probably not historical, so it's going to be open space or housing. And since it's landlocked, it's not going to be housing, so it's going to be open space. So it would probably, and because it's contiguous with Flag Hill, it would make a lot of sense. So I think it's one of the reasons, and I, I won't speak for CPC, but I mean one of the reasons that the uh, that they were more comfortable with using CPC funds on that piece was that if that were to happen, it would be. It's not one of the prime pieces that you would pick those four acres to 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 add to the open space, but at forty thousand dollars is relatively inexpensive, and it would be contiguous to to land that was already protected. Well, so that still end up as open space. That, that would end up as open space, and the other piece could be sold on the market. As a hammerhead lot, would you? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. It is already approved. Okay. Thank exactly. You. So it's there's a little bit of a back out of that. I just realize time is uh, short until there isn't too much time before August 8th, but it seems to me that as part of due diligence, mm -hmm. okay, that you could or would have, maybe should have, walked the land and gotten, you know, well, if I, I want to know, if I want if it's raining outside, I don't know a TV or consult, I look, I look, you know, I just open the window and see if it's <laughs> raining, okay? I but, have. But uh, have you, have yes. you, have you walked the land? Have yes. you walked, you have, you yes. have actually? Yes. When? Okay. Well, I mean, twice. I don't remember. I don't have well, dates and times. Well, 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 uh, end, end of June, beginning of after April? after we had um, the notice. After we had notice and before the public hearing, and that was somebody who walked it twice in that time period. Does it, is there a reason that you asked that question? I mean, is there some reason we should go at a different time than what was walked? No, question. we've been renting it because this whole process has taken so long that our lease ran up and we had nowhere to live. So we're renting that house and I just haven't seen anyone there. So I was oh, wondering okay. when that happened. Right. I thought you meant there was a reason to go at a different no, time. It just the, the impression was that it had not first been The first time Susan was still there. Yeah. Okay. Sure. She was mowing the lawn when I came in and we waited. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the first time. Yeah. I think it was Susan. Somebody was mowing the lawn. <laughs> yes. So, so when you're walking the land and, and, and surveying with your engineers, are they also looking at the wildlife and the hawks and what potential habitats that might be there? Uh, that's not something that I'm qualified to do. I think that's something that would obviously need to be done. Well, there's another question that came up earlier. You didn't have an answer, but all of those units that are going to be built across the road, you yes. weren't quite sure where that access will be. It's important that you know where that access yes. will be. Mm -hmm. And that would be part of the permitting process. 
if this land were to be acquired and the group and the committee that we brought together decided that there was some part of the proposal that they would be pulling together would be addressing that. Now I have since the, the we have engaged the highway uh, department to come in and talk about sight lines at least in that area and um, and their initial feedback was yes I can see why the planning board originally wanted to combine those because it in there's plenty of sight lined out toward the airport but in the other direction it's very close to 200 feet and it's because of the elevation and the curve and so that was that was an issue there are there are mitigations for that my understanding is they're expensive so I guess that would be another kinds of thing that you would have you would have to look at to are we dynamiting the road I mean the topography <laughs> does not change I, I, I have no idea I, mean, I have no I just completely out of my if you have something that would molecular biology I could answer the question <laughs> uh, if you have something about something about engineering I, I have a hard I have a, a very crucial piece yeah absolutely crucial piece project. it's a crucial piece but it's not something that we can address we, we just definitely can't address that before the time if you go back and look at the proposed plan that's still open for the public hearing which would be closed I guess we'll continue on the ninth planning board uh, the toll brothers are showing a, oh for cross street okay sorry an easement or some gyration that will give the town the right to use 50 foot wide strip or something in their property to make a turning some sort of a turning for the fire trucks or something yeah well no yeah. it's actually to potentially widen the road and straighten it a little bit so there's a little strip i heard something the about road on the, on so the other side that could be used to straighten this is so i mean I, i'm just saying personally the town would have to pay for that yeah, 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 totally yeah. absolutely so we'll you know th th this would be something that the committee this would be I, I would think from what I've heard in terms of you know the ledge deal with you know can you find place for two two cellar holes on eight acres mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. um, can you can you know this the well the, I think on eight acres we'd be able to if we were doing a small number of units we'd be able to, to, to fit that all that stuff in I think the issue that's going to be most difficult is going to be is, is going to be sight lines along the driveway and I don't know I personally don't know what the answer is the best mm -hmm. in, our, in our highway department said yes it's not undoable but it's an, it's it, there might be a concern there. So the question would be, what's the right thing to do there? And again, if it turns out that the only the you know what, there's no good, there's no good you know mitigation for that. And what what is needed is maybe we just build one unit and we can't afford to build one affordable unit. We say, well, we're going to sell that land because we can't we can't afford to do what needs to be done. That could be one of the things that happens. But Have yes. you explored the uh, the kind of legal issues that have come up with overburdening the easement for the driveway. So I think you were asked at two separate right. board selectman meetings to look into access. Right. So what has come of those discussions? So so the, the the easement is really just related to the current okay. permitted use. Um, and if we we're just gonna build one unit on a hammerhead lot, you know, it would probably be too expensive to make that affordable unit. It would be the most it would be the most expensive affordable unit possibly in Massachusetts, but but certainly in in, in Stowe. So that probably is would not be the area it would go in. It would anything that would happen there would need to relook at and repermit and would most likely use the fifty foot strip and not the, the, the shared driveway if if the sight lines can be addressed. So that's the most I'm, I'm just saying what, what I, I I'm saying this is my opinion most likely it's not so you haven't looked into it. we we have asked the highway department about what that would be but but the point would be well we have look we have the easements we have the documents the those those are under current permitting the easements exist there's no problem with that but again we would have to repermit and maybe if when we go to the permit we might propose something on that 50 and the planning board or the ZPA would say no we want you to do something else, and uh, we—and that's something that we—that's part of the permitting process. That's part of what would happen when you sat down with the, with the mm -hmm. permitting boards. Is that fair, Karen? Mm -hmm. So then, to follow up question on the sure. most expensive unit in Massachusetts. Right. Um, obviously, you're not going to build just one unit. Let's say, based on the numbers. We don't know. We don't know that, but it's, it's probably unlikely. It would be the most it's expensive unlikely. unit in it, Massachusetts. It's, it's, it's unlikely. It would probably okay. cost. So anyway, you build X number of units, you have land costs, you have building costs. A, who pays for 
the development? Are you expecting an outside developer to come in and you just provide the land and they plant the houses? Or does that money come from, from, from the town? There's somewhere? different ways. There, there's multiple paths along those lines. And that goes from the town subsidizing, heavily subsidizing each unit to the town paying no money whatsoever. Okay. And it's this kind of negotiation takes years. Mm -hmm. And there's just no way that there's just no way to speak intelligently so if about that. If you that have I mean, to ignore the land costs, just, uh, say a unit costs three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to build just kind of ballpark number, and then it's capped at 199. Yeah, 200,000. So you're asking the the town to make up that $150,000 right. deficit. Yeah. Right, which would be, I mean, and there are towns that do that. Bedford routinely, yeah. Bedford routinely spends $150,000 to $180,000 per unit. Um, but they have a lot more money. Than I mean, they're right on 128. They get a lot of develop, you know, developers want to build commercial stuff and they give money to them and they, they're filthy with it and they spend it. So God bless them, you know what I mean? But we, we don't have that. Yes. So if if the town buys the land, does does the somebody I don't know who it would be have to go through the same kind of comprehensive permit process yes. that the builder mm -hmm. would have to exactly. do? Exactly. So there would be planning board meetings. Mm -hmm. and exactly. Mm -hmm. Just like exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, 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 that's not, well, no, that's not I mean, the permit. the letter the letter would be exactly the same. I think that this would be a much I mean because it's the town and it's a community doing it, it's going to be a much more open process. It's not somebody yes. bringing. You know, it would be a proposal that would be developed by the community and brought to the, and I think with input from both planning board and the ZBA, it's not something that when we got to the ZBA it would be potentially the idea that it wouldn't be contentious at that point because all those meetings had been, had been, had occurred, right, in conversations. So you had a couple slides on Chapter 40B. I don't know if you wanted to very quickly go through them. Oh, yeah, there they are. I don't know how familiar you all are with Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40B. It's also known as you the take this Affordable this Housing Law. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, this you has you been know more about it anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, this has been in enacted for gosh, 30 years now. Uh, it used to be that you had to get a, an affordable housing restriction for the house, but it was capped at about 20 or 30 years. That's changed, so now it's all new housing that goes under Chapter 40B is in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge thing. Uh, good or bad, some towns like Newton are struggling because they built a whole lot of affordable housing under the old plan. Mm -hmm. And now that's starting to expire. And so Stowe has most of it, not all of it, but most of our affordable housing is under the newer deed restriction. So basically, it allows a developer to get a permit approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, to do a development bypassing a lot of the local bylaws, rules, and regulations so long as 25% of the development qualifies for affordable buyers. So we do have examples of that here in Stowe. Um, Villages of Stowe is the biggest, most recent example of that. So it's usually a mix of market rate and then the affordable units. The market rate units offset the cost of the affordable. Um, there are all kinds of restrictions. They can't make so much more than, what, 20%, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. Oh, that's the next slide. The next slide. Um, but basically, the town doesn't really have much say in denying it. Mm -hmm. uh, we can help influence it. We can help shape it. Uh, but basically, we can't outright say no unless, unless we have a housing production plan that's been approved and certified yeah. by DHCD, <laughs> uh, going back, okay. uh, and that we're making progress against it that we're actually producing a number of units, and as Mike said, it's about 13 units per year, or if we've already reached that 10% of certified affordable housing on the SHI. So with where we sit right now today, mm -hmm. Stowe does not have grounds to deny one of them. We did, but we don't today. Yeah. Yeah. So we did actually have two years safe harbor because we had an approved housing production plan. Uh, the Pilot Grove 2 actually got built and got uh, building permits and occupancy permits. And so at, because of that, we met a certain, you have to have 1% for two years or um, half a percent for one year, safe harbor. So we had two years safe harbor. Um, should the other uh, 
a plantation two have gone into, kicked in, we would have had safe harbor for that. But because that did not go through, we're now kind of struggling. Can I, so, can I ask something? Yes. Please. Um, Laura, maybe clarify uh, the process that we're going through right now in taking a look at this chapter land reads as us being very active in our housing production plan. So that's another reason that the Housing Trust, on behalf of the citizens of Stowe, is doing this work. That's right. why we're, we're talking to you and finding the critical tension points and trying to move towards a resolution. Because in the eyes of the state and the housing production uh, plan, we are doing our work. So there was a question a earlier. Follow up comment on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in this particular instance, you are actually no different how you are acting than an external developer coming into town with respect to the residents that are living close to this. There's no difference with this. You're doing exactly the same thing. You're proposing to put way more homes in, in a, a piece of lot under the assumption of affordable housing which is what you're worried about with, <coughs> with external can developer purchasing land. land. Can I finish? Sure. Purchasing land in town and building, you know, density of homes that you don't have control over. This is exactly the same thing that you're proposing to do to me as a resident of Stowe and yes. my neighbors as a resident of Stowe. Certainly. Well, so really, when we know, do create our housing production plan, it's with input from the community. So I think we are trying to represent the, the good f across the entire town. So you're right, we cannot do affordable housing on a standard conventional lot. The economics just are not there. So we are going to have to be creative and it may require some density, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we are still meeting the septic and water requirements that we have to meet and that we are really addressing how the town wants to see affordable housing. And that's exactly where we went with our housing production plan. We participated in a survey for the master plan where we got feedback that affordable housing should be sprinkled throughout the town. It should be infilled. It shouldn't be put into certain areas and only in those areas. And this is an example of us following what we were told by the town. That is not a 40B. That is an active adult neighborhood. It's an overlay district that town meeting approved. So, getting There's back to street. Chapter 40B, there was a question at the very beginning that talked about what happens if you don't have 10%, what are the implications? Well, <coughs> remember all that chapter <coughs> land I talked about? Chapter 61, 61A, 61B, a lot of them are large, large, large parcels. We do have a lot of our orchards and our golf courses and uh, open space in chapter land that the town just cannot afford. That is prime property for real estate agents <laughs> to sell to developers who want to put large-scale 40B developments. Just keep that in mind. Yes. Every golf course you drive by, you have 400 houses on it. Yeah, house fun. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we're making progress following the input from the town that we received, keep plugging away, and this is not the only opportunity we're looking at, by the way. We have we received uh, the custody of two very tiny little parcels, a 0.3 acre and one that's just under one acre. We're trying to see if we can put affordable housing on those acres. And it looks like we might be able to do tiny, tiny, tiny. We're talking like a one or two bedroom unit, <laughs> but very small. And that was in that original picture of potential affordable housing. It was reflected in that. So we are trying to look across the town, address the opportunities that we can, while being as proactive as possible, which is very limited. You mentioned large parcels. When do you see reaching the kind of percent so we don't have to get more control of the well, potential? Well, you know, when I, I, just in, in the anecdote, when I first started in this process with the housing partnership before the trust existed, um, we're just going through the Villages of Stowe permitting process, and um, one of the original, one of the original um, proposals for Villages of Stowe, and you remember this, was going to be a lot of rental units. Yeah, it was, it was like a hundred and like a hundred twenty rental units. Right, in addition to in addition, the townhouses. in addition to the townhouses, there was going to be hundred and twenty rental units. 
And for 40B, if a quarter of those are affordable because they're rental and the, town, and the state wants to encourage rental, then all of those units count as, a, as toward your SHI. So in one, in one development, we could have been, you know, it's 16 percent. And the town said, absolutely not. It's not what we wanted to do. And it really made the developer back up. Every, you know, it, it cost a lot of royal. It, you probably remember the time. Uh, other folks have been here for a while. It was, I can't even remember the year. It's 2003, 2002. No. It, was a, it was a lot, it was a lot of upset. And, and it was, it, was it, it almost threatened to tear the town into west, east to west, because the, the west, you know, the whole west portion was like, no, you know, and the east portion, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was terrible. It was, it was, it was divisive. So, um, to get to 10%, is it likely that we're going to be able to, to build something on the scale that's going to be able to get us to 10%? I'll tell you, if I win the lottery personally, I will donate a fair amount of it to build affordable housing and stuff. Just because I spent all these years and I will do it. But, but I don't play the lottery, so it's less likely. But, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head right. because this issue really is a small piece of such a larger problem. Courtney said it's you have to meet a quota, you have to have affordable housing, and there's no available land that you can afford. We've got to figure out right. a better way so, of so that money. In the short, yeah, absolutely. And in the short term, what our idea is to try to build enough units to build to get safe harbor mm -hmm. so that we have more control over the unit over the development that happens in town so that we can get larger is, instead of just getting twenty five percent, we can get a larger percent by allowing people to do a little bit more density in certain areas or by doing or by, by trading off other things to be able to have more control over that so that we can get closer to that. And maybe we are gonna, maybe one of those golf courses will get sold, or I, mean, I don't wanna pick on golf courses. Maybe some area, something that's not currently developed that's under chapter land will get sold. You know, I'm sorry everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get sold and there's gonna be 600 units put there, but because we're under safe harbor, because we built our measly two six unit things and we got our, our, our 13, woo -hoo, when that thing happened to hit, we have more control over it so that we can have more, more, we can provide more direction to how, how, how we make that number and then maybe we do make our number. But it's hard to know what, what that will be because most of the, most of that chunk between 7.1 where we are and 10 is going to be private. And it's question is, do we have control over what happens there or does somebody just come in and do whatever they want? And, and I think that's, and that's unfortunately where we live. And that's that's what's going to be. So the question is, how do we make progress and do what makes sense when we can, when we can afford it, when it makes sense, so that we have control, so that when a big, you know, that that big development comes, which we all you know know is going to come, and hope well, that we we're not going to right, right, exactly, yeah. you know, that we have that we happen to be in a situation where we're under where where we have more control over what happens there. And, and yeah. is that is that a fair? Assessment from in in that regard, this is nothing secret with the sale or, the, or transference of uh, Stow Acres. The new the people who have bought it or right. now control it. It's uh, right. I'm still unclear exactly what that means, uh, but they have made no bones about the fact that for the time being we're going to run those two 18-hole golf courses, but. Also, be able to, we're not hiding anything. We, housing is part of our future. So they could continue, if they really go gangbusters, run one successful golf operation, and the other one, how many acres is half of that? A couple hundred acres. You come in with an unfettered 40B, you could be looking at four or 500 units. So Look what's happening in Stowe right now. I mean in Sudbury. Sudbury. Sudbury Center. They have two 240 units being proposed right near their historic town center. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing. We have to make some incremental infill, not look for, we can't do these projects as a town on a large scale. Mike is exactly right. If we are responsible and we look at small units. I mean, one of them is on Pine Point Road that they're talking about. 
You have to be kind of a mountain goat to get into that lot. It's right down below. Put an the escalator way. in. Uh, but but if it's possible, there's a one small unit, and you. So we can't say don't do that one there because it won't get us to the 13. It's an increment to it. If we could only put two on this, and that's politically and geographically, topographically, economically, whatever else lead, <laughs> you're going to throw on there, it's going to help. It's going to show the intent of the town. So I think it, just because we don't, we can't accomplish it all at once, I hope we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's, let's look at this closely. I think, I think you had your hand up first. Sorry. I think the important point to, to realize, though, is no one here thinks that the But I don't think 241 Boxboro Road is the answer to that. You know, it's it's a property where mm. there are some major concerns, and you know, it, I think residents have you know voiced that concern. Uh, we are obviously we don't know the buyers trying to buy 241 Boxboro Road since December of last year. Um, if we would could have kept it in chapter land, we would. But it, we didn't even know what chapter land was at the time. And I don't believe that the seller would have continued to have it divided and sold it in the way that it was if she thought that it would be developed because she wa her intention was to keep it open. So, you know, unfortunately, tell me if we're missing something here, but, you know, we would have liked to have kept it open. And you mentioned that earlier, that it's the seller's intent to convert. Well, it wasn't really her intent to convert, but that's what's that's happened. That's what she did. <laughs> that's what's happened. She didn't have yeah. a choice but to. It's just it's part of a sale. It's not a conversion. There, she there have are two routes there that you didn't make. A, a seller <laughs> would have to go you know, through a lot yeah, of Let's deal with where we are. I mean, I, in terms of what where it was, and I was like, this is where we are. You know, we've been the town has been offered an opportunity, an option to buy this property, and what we have to decide is, is it a good value or not? And as a town, and not this is not smart. This is not a good, our job is to investigate it, put the information in front of the town, uh, and get input from as many people as we can, including yourselves. And we really appreciate. I, mean, I appreciate your patience tonight. We've gone a long time, but I, I really appreciate that you've been here, and you know, and it's been a it's been a good conversation. And I realize. There's a lot of emotion behind it, and uh, I'm glad because I think there's passion about the town. But we're done. Let me, let me Please. Deal with my comments. Please. Why aren't we going back to look at 323 Great Road? You've got a nice piece there <laughs> between two churches on the main drag the sidewalk to well, shopping. The, the two, the, I'd say the, the main reason, number one you reason. You look at this one too. Yeah, yeah. Look at 323. The, the main reason is, is that because it's, it's so centrally located, I think so that there was. The idea was is that if someday we need another municipal building, if we put a house there, it's we're not going to knock a house down and put a building up. But if we have a park there that has no strings on it, and we need that land for municipal purposes, it's something that could be done in the future. We're not going to put conservation restrictions or anything on that park so that we're there uh, except for what is already there. So there was two reasons for that, and I and I agree. I think from a planning perspective, listen, I, I was arguing pretty strongly for putting housing there. I believe housing should have been there, but I understand the argument, the other arguments. I mean, I understand that. And as you know, it's taking my housing hat off and putting my citizen hat on. I say, you know what, you know that that wasn't a that wasn't a. I can't argue with that decision. It was maybe not the decision I would have made, but it was a good. You know, it was it's a fair decision. I mean, it was fair. It was, we we got a chance to talk about it, and and the fact that you know if. You know, if I'm still living here 15 years from now, and we want to, and we want to put a swimming pool in because, or you know, a hockey rink or whatever it is, and we have to have, that and, and that's what the town wants, and we have that property there. Everybody's going to look like a, you know, Don, you and your board's going to look like a group of geniuses, and we appreciate that. Do things have changed drastically? We're talking about the golf course, and the reality right. We're talking about citizens putting a place across the street from a new city installed. Right across the street. A whole lot of situations are different. Yes. The three, two, three, great, low ones yes. down. You're talking to the wrong group. <laughs> 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 we, we agree with you. <laughs> we, we actually advocated for putting housing there. I know, so. I know. But I'm saying, and I believe many of those same arguments were made, yeah. however. <laughs> well, however, but. I think it be revisited, can't it? Um, no. I mean, it's not, it's it not a closed yeah. deal, is it? I mean, we own the land. We haven't built the park yet. 
we could yes. still keep a little space. Boy, I sure wish some of you folks would have been in that, <laughs> at that selection <laughs> meeting because there was really nobody speaking it except for me speaking in favor of, of it at that particular meeting. Um, and every, there was about 40 people talking about the parks, but we're not talking about that right now. So yeah, I appreciate it. Park down the road I appreciate now. it. And, and, and maybe we'll build something at 241 and at 323, which is what I'd like to hear. But, um, <laughs> All right. Uh, Courtney, I think you had your hand up. I just um, could make one more comment, which is that we're the, we're the town to vote against purchasing this land. Um, hopefully, the sale will go through. Um, for the house that you've been so patiently waiting for. Mm -hmm. But the other lot will go back on the market. Mm -hmm. um, if for some reason, I mean, I have no hope for this, but if for some reason your land and the lot next to it were to be able to be combined, mm -hmm. there is a possibility that a builder could come in and purchase those two things together and could develop this as densely or more densely. You know, by by the town purchasing this, we actually have the opportunity to have a lot of control. Our land they're, we're talking about a, a committee, not your land, but, but if the town makes this purchase, they're talking about making having a committee where everybody can show up and, and you know shape the process. And the town owns the land. And if they say, all right, we just can't build on a hammerhead lot, you've got open space in your backyard, just the way you did before. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong to you, but nobody's going to go there because they should get there from the air. So by, all, by the town purchasing this, this parcel, this pair of parcels, we actually, in a lot of ways, get a better shot at shaping what happens behind the two of you than anything else. You yeah. have the perfect Which opportunity to go on. there yeah. and, and speak speak eloquently without being angry so that people can hear you and just help shape the process. It's all you. It's, it's our yeah. town. If it goes back to the builder, if, let's say you don't, you know, the hammerhead, it goes up and, the, and it goes back to the original guy who wants to build something. Is he in a position to request a change in the permit? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. In other words, you are because you're the town, supportable housing, it's a high priority. But it's the builder who's buying it. Under Chapter 40B, right. a developer could come in, a builder could come in, yeah. exactly. and do exactly what we're proposing, probably on a I more dense scale. But at that, that point, at that point it, would be, that? it would be the only the Hammerhead 4 acre, yeah. 4.1, whatever. Because we would right. then own the 4.17, right. exactly. it would yeah. it, it would right. remain right. part of the contiguous 5.67. Right. But that four acre parcel under Chapter 40B could probably support eight to twelve units. If they could find eight, oh. eight seller mm -hmm. holes, they could punch it. Or the they do well, a, a, a right. package well, treatment. I mean, that's, I mean that's yeah. I mean that's not. Really that land no. is under right. contract by a buyer that intends to build one house. Right. Well, and again. But so, the so, so, so the answer to your question, yeah. if they went through the Chapter 40B route, which this committee would have to go through, the de developer would do that. Mm -hmm. And if you had a developer that wants to do a Chapter 40B route, they're going to go with the most dense development he can get. Right. He can. And it's not going to be all affordable. It's going to be 25% affordable mm -hmm. and market rate. I think with smart <coughs> have control and the look and density and feel of the development versus so just taking into consideration the community, which a exactly. which a forty B developer doesn't have to pay a fig right. attention I mean, to. Right. Not, I mean, you're presuming that he would be. No, that, that's 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 the only way. That the only more, way right. if he's a forty B developer, right. if he really wants to build more than one residence. That's the only way you can ignore the zone. That's, that's the only way you can ignore the zone. The, 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 the only other property. way is otherwise he would keep it as is currently. His like he says he's mm -hmm. going to have one house on there. Right. So he, as a lone builder, would not have the opportunity then to change that permit as it exists. He could right. sell it to somebody else could, right. who would then come in and exercise 40-day yeah. rights. Right. Or someone could buy it. Okay. Well, that's why I but said there's no guarantee that it won't change in the future. That's less than fair market value. And mm -hmm. and no is it, we're, we're, this yeah. is an area which that, that, yeah. that we certainly have no expertise in. So, right. I mean, just in terms of the, like, what might happen. Um, but I think it's, it is instructive to know that, that 
that there's there are other realities. Mm -hmm. There are other things that yeah. can happen. So. so one underlying question in this whole thing, from our point of view, sure. because we are already in contract for yep. you know the part with the house on it. Why do you need all eight acres if if there's a chance of only building two or three units for four or six bedrooms? Why do you need eight acres for six bedrooms? Um, well, see, that's just excellent point, excellent question, and the thing is that would save you forty thousand dollars that you could put right, into. Right, but but if you're looking, plus. but right, but if you're looking at eight acres for one hundred eighty versus four acres for one hundred forty in terms of what you, yes, if you only do two units, it's probably that's that's a possibility. Um, and you know, th there's not a big difference between it's just be twenty. You know, talking about twenty thousand dollars a unit difference mm -hmm. in terms of land costs. It's not that's not a deal breaker. But if you're asking the town to write off 100 to 150 thousand dollars per unit, that 20 thousand comes back at you, and it's oh yeah. less money that you have to ask for later on. So Poten you're asking for it twice. Poten potentially, potentially again. But yes, that 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 is that is one of the things that is one of the scenarios that we've had to look at. Again, and that's with one of the things if we got permission to buy it, but the CPC didn't. The, C, the article four, the, the, the second article didn't get approved. That would have to. That decision would still. That would. That's still a viable decision. That to buy the one acre just with smart money, and just buy those four, um, those four acres. Um, but that's. I mean, it, it, it's viable. I don't know that it would be something that we would do or not. I think we're. I mean, we were we were mixed in our in terms of our our discussions about it for just a single parcel. We were fairly divided. We were unanimous about both parcels. We were divided about, and I think it would just be a matter of, of that we'd have to really sharpen our pencils and look at what exactly that was going to cost. But, but, you know, absolutely. It's, and more so because the additional acreage gives us more flexibility. So, in terms of infrastructure, in particular, and to reduce the impact on exactly. On, on y'all, yeah. <laughs> I mean, essentially, exactly. if if it's on that parcel, essentially, it's going to be hard to, it's going to be have more impact than if it's on both parcels. You really set, you potentially set things right. way back, so you, you wouldn't even know people were back there. Like what like Courtney was saying at the previous meeting, like you, folks don't even know that our house is back there. And yeah, you got to bring all those cars out. Right? Potentially, well, all those cars. I mean, you know, if it's, you know, again, if it was two. One bedroom units, it's potentially fewer cars. I mean, you know, that's what I think what that committee can say. Listen, we're willing to do that if it's two one bedroom units and that reduces the number of, of parking spaces that we're I mean, essentially the impact could be less than what's currently permitted there. So so yeah, I mean I think you're, you're everyone is wise to look at it and say, Well, what's the worst thing that could happen? But I, Courtney, I appreciate your saying it because the other way to look at it is like, well, what's the best thing that could happen? Actually, it could have less impact than us. And Maybe the guy who's going to build a five-bedroom house there in, in an accessory apartment, put seven bedrooms there. Maybe he won't like that guy so much as the two guys, as the as the as the, as the residents of the two houses that you know are more modest that that not be back. Who knows? I mean, again, your yeah. impact. The, the house that my peop, my neighbors live in has less effect on me than my neighbors. Let's frankly, in terms of my neighborhood, but you know, it's just, that's not. They, maybe that's just on Canterbury Road. Hope Jerry, I hope you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jerry. <laughs> I think it's getting late. Yeah, I don't know about all of you. I, I think we're all pretty much toast. Yeah. Uh, are there other questions that we no, can address before we leave? If not, I'm going to do an advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> we need two members for SMOT. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you are now so all you, experts. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> you sat here, you listened to all of this. I'm sure through osmosis it's starting to sink in. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can't just do it ourselves. We really want the representation How across the town. How many members are authorized? Uh, one, two, three, we have, four, We have seven five, slots and five six, people seven. right now. We have yes. two openings. Yeah. We've had one and opening chronically. Uh, yeah. yes. We have vacant, a general plug that I always give. <laughs> this is Take a look outside when you come in the door. The bulletin board to the left is probably 30, 40 opportunities to serve this government it doesn't run on autopilot and we can't afford to hire professionals to do all of the stuff that's being done whether it's on housing or conservation or planning you name it we need help but we now have experts on chapter right. 40b and chapter 61 and uh, affordable housing so well, please thank you all i mean again this information session there's no decisions 
taken or, or, or intended. The idea was to be able to try to answer as many questions and give as much background as we can. Hopefully we've done that. I can't imagine that you've liked all the answers that we've given, <laughs> but um, trying to be as honest and, and, and clear as, as, as we possibly can. Um, town meeting, you know, we'll, we'll make similar presentation at town meeting. And at that point, town, you know, town meeting is our legislative body and we'll decide what will happen. And, um, and you know, we, we, we accept if we go to town meeting, town says, this is not what we want to do. That's, you know, our job is to bring it to town and say, do you want to do this or not? And say all the good reasons why this happens. The town says, no, we're not going to, I mean, I'm not going to, we're not going to, you know, we're going to, as, as you said earlier, we'll go on to the next one. We'll go on to the next opportunity. Um, we've been told no quite a few times in the past <laughs> few years. And, and it doesn't, hasn't stopped us from doing this, you know. So, I mean, that's, that's what we, we knew when we got involved in this, is that, you know, this is, this is not the most popular use of land in town. And, but we also, because of the years we've spent getting educated about the value of it to the town, we continue to plug and do it. So, so um, this be the last informational meeting before town meeting? Uh, you to present um, we have one more SMOT meeting. Numbers. There, I think this last informational meeting. Again, this will be taped and it'll be on. So if your neighbors and stuff, we encourage them to watch Snow TV. I can't remember if it's channel twenty nine or channel thirty, but it's one of those. Um, if they have questions, how can they? Questions. Probably the best thing to do is to send an email to me and, your and my phone and my, my information is on the website on the Stowe uh, Municipal, well it's, I think it's just called Housing Trust in, on, the, on, on, on the town page, but mm -hmm. my information is there, how to reach me. And we'll try to get this posted on there soon. Posted very qu quickly. Oh, also, I, I just, just for, I, I think, we ha I have some documents here that we, we have on the website, but I printed some out about a study that was done a few years ago about um, one of the biggest fears that people have about affordable housing near them is, is that it's going to affect their land values. And there's been a number of studies, and this is one that was done in Massachusetts to show that there's very little effect on housing values um, from affordable housing, um, and so, or at least for the, for the options that were, were shown here for the studies, the study that was so done. copies are available? If the, if the PDF's already on the website um, on, on the STO, and there's copies right here, and so folks, if you're on, 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 on in TV land, if you'd like to just go on the website, there it is, so. Thank you for coming out. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thanks for all Appreciate the time you put in on this. Thank you.